You know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, that 50-50 ball, I gotta come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. All right, this is a day we've been waiting for for quite a while. Uh, a, because I'm a nerd when it comes to some of the fitness stuff, but Tommy Moffitt's gonna be joining us here on Texas Radio in the next segment. So this is going to be a rapid fire segment so we can get straight to that one. Welcome into Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio Go Hour presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. I'm David Nuno here in Houston, Texas for one more show. I hope to be back tomorrow and Olin Buchanan is there at the mothership and we call this part of the show Coffee Talk presented by Texas Coffee. Beat the hell out of morning by going to texags.com/coffee. Olin Buchanan, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. I hope everything, I hope, and I know everybody else uh, who follows the show hopes that uh, everything's good with your family. Appreciate that. We had to take my mom yesterday to the ER, unfortunately, after the show, uh, but I think she's trending in the right direction. My dad is absolutely trending in the right direction. Got to uh, spend time with both of them yesterday. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I hope if things continue the way they look yesterday and to this morning, I'll be back in studio tomorrow to do the show from there, which would only mean that things are better for them. But uh, let's get into a couple things, man. Uh, before we get to the Tommy Moffat interview, I'm pumped about it. I know you are as well. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, uh, it's funny because uh, the, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. I'm trying to arrange an interview with Tommy Moffat for a column. And then I found out you had also were trying to arrange him to be a guest. And Alan Cannon says, hey, can we just <laughs> do a one, you know, two birds with one stone? We're saying, yeah. heck yeah. So um, I'm one of those guys that, all, that believe that the strength and conditioning coach is a vital piece of a successful program. You've shown me a successful program, and I guarantee you they have a – a, res- a well-respected strength and conditioning coach. I've said it before, you know, you, when, look at when A&M's been mo- most successful. You know, Larry Jackson, Mike Clark, uh, uh, Smitty, yeah. right? So uh, uh, I think that... Obi, to follow up on that, like, when, when people talk about the strength, strength and conditioning coach, it's not just the pumping of weights, right? No. There is a killer instinct, a mindset... There are those who go to the gym, who check the box, and there are those who have a focused purpose and a uh, this attitude. And I think when you hear Tommy Moffat speak, that's what he preaches. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a toughness that you bring. And this, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, you've heard it many times, but this is the reality of it. They're with the players more than anybody, yes, more sure. than the uh, position coaches, more than the coordinators, more than the head coach. These guys are with them all off season, all season long and setting that mindset from the very beginning. Right, because if you're going to take shortcuts and, and do just enough to get by in the weight room, there's a pretty good chance you're that same guy that's going to take shortcuts and do just enough to get by on the field. Yeah, so we'll, we'll chat with him here. A lot to get into with him. Obi, your friend, I think he's your friend, Matt Hayes, Saturday Down South. He had a yeah. column a day or two ago where he was breaking down the coaches in the SEC. And I just thought for a couple minutes we can kind of go through his list and see how you feel about it. Okay. All right. He has number one. I'll let you guess. Who is the number one coach in the SEC right Uh, now? Kirby Smart. Absolutely. Kirby is number one, followed by – I think you'll probably be able to pick this one out of the coaches. Who do you think number two? Well, everybody's going to be on the bandwagon because Texas went to the uh, uh, playoffs, so probably Steve Sarkeesian. No. No. He's actually got Ryan Kelly. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Um, so Brian Kelly at number two. Hmm. Number three is still not Sark. Lane it's Kiffin. Lane Kiffin. Yeah, okay. I would have had. I thought he would have had Lane third behind Sarkeesian. Yeah. Um, or is he including is, the Texas and Oklahoma coaches? Yes, okay. he sure is. Okay. Sark at number four. Now, I get it. They had a wonderful year. Before last year, he was a 500 uh, career head coach. Yeah. All right, so let's just – if you're looking at the totality of his career and what he did in the past year, I think you kind of – you have to heavily weigh what happened in the last 12 months. No doubt about it. But just say heading into the year, that's where he was. Number five. Kalen DeBoer from Alabama. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, but th- that kind of contradicts not you, but him himself in that saying, well, if now I, I, I don't have a problem with it, but yeah, I mean, he got to the national championship game. He built something there at Washington. Number six. I don't know. Like, if we're going to weigh heavily what happened last year, and I think Sark is proven in that regard, uh, but Hugh Freeze at number six. Huh. Well, yeah. he did some really good things at Ole Miss, and then he did some really bad things at Ole Miss, and he did good things at Liberty, so uh, okay. Uh, okay. And then the next one, I would have put it above – Hugh Freeze, personally. Uh, Josh Heupel at Tennessee. See, I think UCF is one of those programs that if unless as long as you're competent, you're going to be successful. Uh, especially in the conference they were in, right? right? Because you're going to have a better recruiting base. The second and, and third options are probably better than the first options in the states of your primary competition. Uh, okay. All right. I mean, I'm not vehemently. I I, I probably would have. I might have put Drinkwitz there, but uh, okay. Hi, Paul. This right. next one, I have a problem with being above Mike Elko, to be honest with you. Um, but it is what it is. Brent Venables at number eight. Yeah, that. Yeah, that that doesn't make sense to me. Um. Yeah, I know. You know, winning ten games at Oklahoma in the um, Big Twelve. I don't know if that's as. And, and I'm trying to. I'm saying this really. I think ob- objectively. I don't think winning ten games in the Big Twelve at Oklahoma is as impressive as winning nine games at Duke. One hundred percent, Ob. One hundred percent, and you can't disregard what he did in his first year there. Didn't they win five his first year? That's yeah, something at like yeah. So. Or maybe it was six games, but yeah, so no doubt. Number nine, again, this is one that I think should have been much higher on the list if you're going to weigh heavily what happened in 2023. Eli Drinkwitz from Missouri. Yeah, I would have put him higher. Um, I I don't know how you can't be impressed with what he's done uh, at Missouri. Really tough, really a tough place. But you know what? He's starting to recruit Missouri. Uh, the, The state laws there are helping him. Because they say, you know, in Missouri, you can't, you can pay an NIL deal to high school guys as long as they're going to a Missouri university. Well, there's only one. So, um, but that said, you know, one of the biggest mysteries is how can you have St. Louis two and a half hours to your uh, east and Kansas City two and a half hours west and a bunch of big corn fed farm boys in between and can't win at Missouri? Right, and looks like you find a guy that's figured it out. So we'll move on on the list here. We'll go to number 10. That's where Mike Elko shows up. I'm going to read the little blurb from uh, our friend Matt Hayes. Uh, The now, it's hard to argue the success at Duke. Now just wins and losses. Not just wins and losses, but the recruiting and the development on both sides of the ball. Riley Leonard, Jordan Waters, Brandon Johnson. Uh, He goes through all these names. The future, if Mike Elko couldn't do it at Texas A&M, but he accomplished at Duke, uh, with the recruiting and development, this will become a playoff team. He has all the advantages he didn't have at Duke, um, and he's not playing in the same league. So I think, again, I, I'm not here to argue where Coach Elko should be on the list because I think new coaches in a conference, you know, you, you got to prove yourself, right? I get that. Uh, but Eli Drinkwood should be higher. Um, Hugh Freeze should be lower. And I think Coach Elko, for what he did at Duke, 
no doubt. And what he's done in his first however many days in office should put him higher than number 10 on the list, OB. Well, you know, I definitely would put him ahead of Venables. You know, you can make you can make whatever arguments you want to make. I would definitely put him ahead of Venables because of, of the reasons I said. You know, um, they just – it's Duke. Yeah. And – uh, David Cutcliffe has won there, and and I'm talking about in recent memory. And uh, Mike Elko has won there, and Steve Spurrier has won there. And everybody else has failed. I'll finish out the uh, the list here. Mark Stoops at 11, Sam Pittman at 12. <laughs> You've got Shane Beamer at 13, Billy Napier at 14, and then the last two, Jeff Lebby at Mississippi State, and Clark Lee at Vanderbilt. I will say this. Shane Beamer, that – I think I'd put him ahead of Sam Pittman. I well, think I would. I mean, last year he probably would have put Beamer in the you know upper half. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Kelly. I mean, not Kelly. Uh, Stoops has had some nice years at Kentucky, but more often than not, he's had very pedestrian years. Yeah, yeah. So that's the list there. From uh, you can read the whole article. So it's, it's an interesting read. Again, I don't get mad at opinions, Ob, but I do. I do think when you do have opinions um, and you put it out there, we can discuss it, right? And we can. I, I think Coach Elko should be higher, um, and uh, Hugh Freeze should be lower. And that that's that's where I would start. And then I think obviously uh, Venable should be lower as well on that list. Yeah, and um, if you want to put Sark there, fine, but use that same reasoning with Eli Drinkwitz. Right. I'd be really interested, though, and I know that you feel the same way. What you really care about is how they're going to rank after the season, right? Look, 100%. I have no, uh, I have no issue with where you're going to put Elko because it doesn't matter. But I'm I'm absolutely fine with Mike Elko as my coach. Now, complete transparency when they were talking about DeBoer at you know early in the process, hey, is could this be a candidate? I'm like, hey, that would be great. Right. But for me personally, uh, having seen the defenses here with my own eyes and then what he did at Duke, uh, Elko was always my first choice, even though I have to admit I was my interest was piqued uh, by the DeBoer rumor. No doubt about that. All right, let's uh... – Go around the room and say hello. If you want to be part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us up, 979-693-1150. We will pick it up on the Brian Foley Law hotline, or you can text us at that same number, 979-693-1150. We say hi to Nick Savage, the director extraordinaire. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy, good morning, y'all. What's up? I'm going to take it a different direction here with the uh, Reese's Senior Bowl, all the different, uh, I guess, showcase Bowl games coming up for all of the Aggie prospects going into the NFL draft. And we pulled our radio audience yesterday, and so I would like to to get y'all's take on this. We asked them, who do they think the first Aggie taken in the 2020, 2024 draft will be? We had Edge Cooper on there, Damani Richardson, McKinley Jackson, and Anaya Smith. And running away with it was Edge Cooper oh, yeah. with the first pick. Uh, he seems like a good, good choice there, but I'm surprised McKinley Jackson didn't get a little bit more love there in the middle. And even Anias, I mean, he's dynamic, but uh, we'll see how he grades out exactly. But wh- who do y'all think will be the, the first Aggie taken? Oh, Edge will be a first-round pick. Well, OB, here's how I kind of look at it. Had this poll been taken midseason, I would have probably put McKinley on that list as the number one, especially from what I was hearing at SEC Media Days from the folks, the scouts that were there. Uh, he was highly regarded. Edge was coming off a down year. He he lived up to it. And then Daniel Jeremiah's got him in his top 20. Like So there's reasons that I have changed my mind. But I think some of that has happened here over the last month for the way he's measuring the way the, the scouts are talking about him. Well, I think um, I think he uh, started looking like a first-round pick the day they played Alabama. Right. And he got three sacks, and they couldn't do anything with him. And – that's when people start realizing, hey, well, wait a minute. Let's look at this guy. And then they realize he'd been playing all like to that. He's going to be kind of like Patrick Queen at LSU a couple of years ago, uh, 2019, that people didn't know about him. And then he had a huge year and then he became a first round pick. And I think by and large, nationally, people didn't know about Edgerin Cooper. Um, he was in his first year as a starter last year and looked like he was still figuring it out. Well, 
fella, he figured it out. And you look at him, and he's fast, he's big, he's athletic, he's very physical, and he can make big plays. And yeah. he's made a lot of them. He'll be Man, a first round pick. We've got. I hope my team takes him. I hope my team takes him. My team sucks at linebacker. I hope they take him. Well, the East West Shrine uh, game is on Thursday, and uh, we've got two Aggies playing on that one Edge Cooper and Demai Richardson. And then the uh, Senior Bowl is on Saturday afternoon, I believe at noon, where we've got what? Layden Robinson, McKinley Jackson, and uh, Anaya Smith playing on that one. All right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. Eric Sars in the house. Eric, good morning, buddy. Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Doing all right. How are you? Good, good. David, how's Houston? I, I didn't know you were going to be here today. I'm a little sad. It's all right. I'm, I'm glad you pay attention to the show on the days you're not working. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, every day, everything's going well, though. Uh, I was sick last week, but good to be back in studio and uh, looking forward to a, a big weekend in, uh, in Aggie sports. We've got a lot of things going on this weekend. All right, let's get to it. Yeah, so uh, first of all, women's tennis at Miami Friday at 11 a.m. We also got the men's track and field team. Charlie Thomas, last home meet of the season. That's going to be a Friday and Saturday meet starting at 2 o'clock on Friday, 3 o'clock on Saturday. But, of course, the big one is the men's basketball on Saturday at 3 p.m., so be sure to pack Reed. Got a big one going up there uh, against Florida. Huge huge game. Huge game. Vital. Yeah. Um, and Florida is a team that's trending it up, OB. And I, would you say A&M is kind of just at a plateau? Yeah. I, I wouldn't well, say they're trending down. They're not trending up yet. Well, it looks that way. You know, they're kind of just leveling out, hopefully not flatlining. They got a uh, – they really need a win, um, especially when you see what's going on in the SEC and what they still have to play. South Carolina's playing really well. You got to go to Alabama. You got two games with Tennessee. You need to finish at least 500 and um, uh, in the SEC race to feel good about getting into the NCAA tournament. So this is a big – Big vital game on Saturday. Does this at all remind you of two years ago when maybe they were kind of plateauing, but then they they caught fire? SEC played towards the end of the season, well, able to get in. Yeah, we've or been talking. Uh, make, make the NIT. They well, didn't get in. They got robbed. But. Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. Now, of course, fortunately, they haven't lost. What was it? They haven't had an eight game losing streak. Fortunately, but they need to uh, hit that what we call the February surge. Now, the February surge typically begins after. Um, Valentine's Day, but uh, it needs to come early. They need a, they need an early surge, an early February surge. Ob, I had a senior moment. Okay, I have them all not the time, really but let's moment. hear. It. I just had a moment, and I didn't look. Coach Moff is not uh, scheduled to join us until eight thirty-five, so we got an open segment to get into. So we can do a short segment coming back as we get ready for uh, Coach Moff. I wrote down eight twenty, but the text clearly says eight thirty-five. So right. we'll talk to him at eight thirty-five. Okay. So, you think he's a big protein guy? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, just be around you. All these weightlifting guys have protein, protein, protein. I, I, something tells me he's a gram per body uh, pound kind of guy when it comes to the protein intake he takes. you agree yeah. with that science behind uh, that, OB? I have no idea. I think he's more of a uh, <laughs> go out there and kick some ass and take some names guy. And eat some rib tips while you're at it? At now, Carlos? I think everybody's a rib tip guy. Uh, if it's if it's uh, Tuesday and Saturday, I mean, if you're not, you ought to be because you ought to be heading over to Fargo's and get the meat dessert that'll change your life. But you know, today's Wednesday, so today you could get your carbs and your protein with uh, uh chopped beef, that delicious chopped beef they have over there on on a baked potato. Well, that's the thing, man. You can get carbs, protein, fats every day you go there as we make this a scientific bit. But the, the reality is the food is just phenomenal. It doesn't matter what day you go. If you go on Friday, you can get the four C's. If you go on Saturday, you get the rib tips. You just can't go on, on Sunday or Monday, but that just makes you want it more. It makes you want it more. We want what you can't have. Maybe you got to get into the science of why the taste buds can differentiate Fargo's from other barbecue places. It's an explosion of taste buds there. 1701 South Texas Avenue in Bryan, without a doubt, the what? The best barbecue in Texas, i.e. the entire world. Hey, did you know that that's actually their trademark? Well, it's because it's true. Yeah, it is. It's Fargo's.
All right, guys, we're back. Tex Ags Radio. Oh, excuse me. And you. Uh, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is uh, the Go Hour presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looks so good with Maroon U. All right, so programming update, Tommy Moffitt, the strength and conditioning coach, will be with us at around 835. So we will chit-chat with Tommy, uh, excuse me, Mr. Moffitt. I'm not on a Tommy basis with him, with Coach Moffitt here at 835. OB, I want to get into some stats. Um, we have uh, Ethan Jones who does a lot of stats for us, broke down some AM stats, and I, I thought I'd kind of read them to you, and we can react a little bit together. So he starts off with Wade Taylor and Tyrese Radford. All right, Both are obviously the leading scorers on the team, averaging 13 points for Radford, 20 for uh, Wade Taylor. They've accounted for 40.3 of the total points scored this season by AM, even with Radford missing five games. However, the Aggies are more successful when Taylor and Radford score fewer points, something you have talked about on a couple different occasions. And just to kind of understand this, in the wins, those two gentlemen are averaging 29.3. and the losses combined, they're averaging 30.4. Um, the percentage of the team's total points in wins, though, is only 37% of the scoring output. In losses, 45.8. Um, so basically, in the wins, Texas A&M players not named Wade Taylor and Tyrese Radford average 49.5 points while in losses, they're averaging only 35.9. So basically, 14-point differential for the rest of the players not named Wade Taylor and Tyrese Boots Radford. Yeah, you know, uh, and we, we've talked about those guys, especially Wade, need more help. And when you have a – look, Wade's giving you 20 points a game, typically, sometimes 30. And we've said it before. I think, if my number's right, Wade's been over 30 – 30 or more five times. And I believe they're one in four in those those games. Because other pe you know, other people have got to do got, got to help. You know, it's a, it's still a team game and you can't rely that heavily on two people. So are you gonna be able to get more production out of Henry Coleman who's been who's been hurt, playing hurt? Um, is Anderson Garcia gonna be a guy that's gonna uh, keep playing the way he does, maybe you get a little extra from him and Solomon Washington, you know, but uh, uh, you need Hefner when he's in there to start making some shots. Um, I know he's been really cold of late. So it's a frustrating team because you look at it, you think, you know, the way Wade plays and the way Boots typically plays, I think he's still working his way into shape. He should be good. If he's not going to be good after this weekend, this week off, uh, then I, I think we're going to have to be wondering what his – State's going to be all year, but yep. um, but if just a couple of guys could raise their productivity just a little bit, you know, A and M loses by three to uh, Ole Miss, you know, and they had the lead. They lost, you know, close to uh, they lost on the last shot to Arkansas after getting down twenty. You know, so you, you look at some of these losses and how close they are, and you're like, man, you are one or two plays away from winning the game, that means I need somebody else to make one or two plays. Yep. Um, I'll continue on. One last stat we'll hit right here. The trend is even more exaggerated when you look at Wade Taylor's individual stats. In wins, he's averaging 17.6 points per game on only 14 and a half shots, and he's got 4.4 .4 assists. In the losses, 23.6 points per game. He, he has six more shots per game. And he's got one less assist per game. Yeah, it, it, in a much um, smaller uh, numbers here, he kind of reminds me of, and you, you wouldn't, I was just a kid, of Pete Maravich. Pete oh, yeah. Maravich at, at LSU averaged like 30 points a game and they went like 15 and 15 because you're having to do too much. And I think sometimes I wonder about Wade, you know, having to score so much. I wonder if, Sometimes he makes a turnover here and there because he's trying too hard because he feels like he's having to carry the team. Yep. OB, I, uh, we only got a couple of minutes left in the segment. Let me read this text that came in at 6.44 in the morning for okay. us from Sam, class of 2021, texting in from the state of Nebraska. He goes, uh, long text, but look at the stats. In regards to DJ Durkin giving up 30 points per game in four of the six losses, I don't feel like that stat is a good measurement. LSU equals bad D game. Okie State, y'all think that was bad? Question mark. Ole Miss, don't throw a pick in the end zone and miss a field goal and win by 10. 
uh, equals winning D effort. Um, offensive stats in the rest of the losses, Miami three turnovers when two uh, with a game that mattered by offense and a kickoff return touchdown. Alabama, one offensive turnover and offensive safety. Tennessee, two offensive turnovers and a punt return touchdown. OB, let me start it off by just saying, if you watched that Miami game and you thought that was good defense by not attacking Tyler Van Dyke at all, philosophy-wise, they did not go after him. And Tyler Van Dyke threw, had a career game throwing on Miami. Throwing on Miami. Yes, uh, I think the D is to be blamed on that game. The offense had their issues, but Connor had a phenomenal second half. Take it from there, OB. Well... Um, you know, I mean, if you want to say that they played good defense against Miami and that they played good defense against Alabama and, oh, it's the fault of the offense for making some mistakes and some turnovers. Yeah, look, I'm not – no one gave a pass to the offense. The coach got fired, right? But uh, – <laughs> and if you're going to tell yourself that, hey, what a great job they did on – Defense. They only gave up 38 points to Ole Miss and had the lead and couldn't get a stop there at the end. But hey, what a great defense play. That tells me you just don't, you're a Durkin fan and I can't change your mind with facts. You know, I mean, you know, here's the numbers. We saw it. Uh, but you know what it is? Hey, you walk into a bar, two guys walk into a bar, they see somebody, one guy says, man, that's awesome. Another one says, nah, I don't think so. You know, fine. Um, you can uh, convince yourself that it was great defense, but it wasn't. I'll, I'll stand by what I said yesterday. Yeah, look, here, the bottom line is the defense did do well in certain areas, right? Uh, a lot of that is talent related, but they couldn't stop a pass. In the Alabama game, did the defense play well enough to win the game? I guess it depends if you consider what Jalen Milrow did in the second half, because in the first half, yeah, the defense won. Uh, played well enough to win that game. Second half, they didn't. Uh, and, and that's what we saw too often. You couldn't stop teams sometimes when they get going. Look at the Tennessee game. Um, yeah, you had your chances. Offense did not come up. And that's why what OB just said there, your offense, your entire staff basically got fired. But the defense didn't stop Tennessee when it had to. And, th and that's a fact. Well, you know, I hear people talk, say, hey, look, you know, they only gave up 20-something points a game. on. Okay, 10 to New Mexico, 3 to Louisiana Monroe. Um, 10 to Abilene Christian, right? You, you want to look at that and say, you realize that, you know, Mississippi State, what a train wreck they were on offense. You get 10. That, that you know, uh, skews the, the numbers. And really, Oklahoma State, you're going you're gonna to put it all in because what a great defensive performance you had in giving up 31 points to – Oklahoma State, I mean, they, they played pretty well. But especially considering the, the circumstances, you know, having to play walk-ons and, you know, and, and true freshmen. So, yeah, they played pretty well, but it's a, it's a bowl game. Yeah. So, uh, well, now, I, I, I stand is, by what I said. Some, I, I appreciate the different perspective, and he's, you're not completely wrong. Uh, the, obviously, the offense did contribute to some of the – uh, uh, defensive issues, but they still couldn't stop anybody throwing the ball all season long. All right, let's hit a break here. We'll come back. I believe Tommy Moffat will be in studio when we come back right now. We're saying don't replace it, lift it. 979-933-8527. That's our good friends there at Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. They are Aggie owned and operated, and they provide an easy, clean service at half the price of replacement. If you've got a terrible driveway situation, it's okay, guys. You don't have to replace the entire driveway. Why don't you just lift it and you'll feel so much better about it? They are problem solvers when it comes to most concrete issues. They're on a 60 years of professional construction concrete experience. Brian Dickerson is the guy who takes care of it. He's an Aggie. He is awesome out there. They're going to educate you on the lifting process, the materials that they use. And by the way, when they come to your house, they'll be out quickly. Like, I don't know how many hours, two, three, four hours, whatever it is. By the time they leave, though, your car goes in and out of the driveway. No problem. It's like, bam, they did it just like that. You get back to life. There's no waiting. No, it's done. When they're done, you get to use it. They'll take care of you residentially commercial, industrial, municipal, and they will do it at a fraction of the cost of replacement. Again, that phone number, 979-933-8527. Again, 979-933-8527. Call them up. They are the place to take care of you. Ascend concrete lifting and support. Don't replace it. Lift it.
All right, we are back here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. I am so sad I am not in studio. I've been talking about this interview since the day he was hired. In December, Texas A&M added the premier coach in the strength and conditioning side of college football, in the industry, to be honest. His name is Tommy Moffat. He comes to Aggieland with over 30 years' experience, including three national titles, multiple strength and conditioning Coach of the Year awards. And uh, I love talking fitness. I love talking mindset. And I want to talk to Coach Moffat here on Texax Radio. Coach Moffat, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks for uh, having me this morning. Well, uh, I want to get into it. I, I know you've talked about it, but I, I want to hear – uh, maybe a little different perspective on why the A&M job, because I, I, I've listened to a couple of your interviews where you waited, right? Yeah. Um, you wanted to get back in. You were doing all the things to to be involved in the fitness side with your own side business, but also talking to coaches around the league. Coach Elko uh, then takes over, gives you a call. Why was that the right fit for you? Um, probably the biggest thing was uh... – when we got let go at LSU, one of my assistant coaches went to work for Coach Elko and his strength coach, David Feely, at Duke. And so it wasn't but a couple of weeks later, uh, after Jeremy took the job, he started calling me and talking about how much he loved working for Coach Elko, how organized he was, uh, how good he was about – uh, supporting the strength and conditioning staff and all the different things that they were doing. So I became a fan of Duke and Coach Elko. And uh, so all you had to do was turn the TV on and watch how they played, uh, how well they were coached. And I knew that when this job came open and I found out Coach Feely wasn't coming, then I did everything uh, possible to uh, to get it, get him on the phone and talk to him. So and, you made the first uh, calls? Uh, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I went after it um, because that's it. So I was telling my friends back in Baton Rouge about Duke, and they, you know, everybody was like, Duke, where's this Duke thing come from? And then, you know, they start beating people. And uh, – so I was a Mike Elko fan uh, long before this job ever came available. And uh, so, yeah, um, I just, you know, as soon as I found out Coach Feely wasn't taking this job, I put the feelers out and started making calls. And then Coach Elko called – well, actually, it was Chad Clunder who called me first. And I had to convince Chad that this was a job that I wanted – and then after that, I spoke to Coach Elko. Man, that's like uh, that's like the prettiest girl in the class coming and asking you out, right? Uh, hey, I got a question for you, okay. and, and I'm sure David, uh, you, you may want to go somewhere else, but I, I have to ask it. So I was watching the interview with T. Bob A. Bear, yeah. And now T. Bob said, not you. I want to make this clear, but T. Bob said, A. and M. You know, it's been a soft program. So if that's true, my question to you would be is, how do you take, if that's true, and how do you make a program or make a team? How do you harden them up? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, I think, you know, every person inherently, if it's a case of fight or flight, most people – Human nature is to run. And, and in college football, you encounter that on every play in the game. And so, first of all, it has to do with how you build confidence in a young man so that he believes in himself enough that he can stand in fight versus flight. And um, that's the first thing – your team has to have confidence in their ability to stand up and face another man in this conference, which is the premier conference in college football. And every school recruits, every school has a strength coach. And you kind of, it's kind of like building calluses on your hand. Uh, but you build calluses in your personality and your ability to stand again when you don't think that you can take another step or perform another rep or um, 
do another jump or whatever the drill might be. It's just a matter of building up calluses over time and stacking those experiences on top of one another until a guy feels like he's invincible. And, and contextually, that's probably as about as good as I can explain it without going into a 48-hour <laughs> dissertation on what we do in the weight room. Uh, but it's just uh, starting from scratch on a daily basis and just building these guys up with every set and every rep of exercise that we do until those guys feel like they're invincible. And I don't know, mind. you know, some people say, you know, that uh, mental toughness or physical toughness is inherent and you can't develop that in a human being, but I disagree with that. And a lot of it doesn't have to do with toughness. A lot of it has to do with confidence and them understanding that the mind gives up mentally. And I firmly believe this, that we as, as humans, we give up mentally before we're ever physically challenged. And so when you develop the mental and the emotional fortitude to be able to push through something that you don't think that it, you're physically capable of accomplishing, then when you are able to do that, then the sky's the limit. Talking to Tommy Moppet here on Texas Radio. I want to follow that up a little bit because how difficult is it to establish that culture when one has been set already for a couple of years yeah. and you have existing players and, and, and making sure that they buy into this is the way we do business from now ahead. Yeah. So I think, you know, it goes with first, you got to set a baseline and we did that on the first day and you establish the rules and the etiquette and, uh, you give them the marching orders that you're supposed that they're supposed to meet each and every day. And it comes with discipline and consistency over time of doing the right thing until the right thing becomes in, you know, inherent and normal. And it's all has to do with establishing that baseline. And we did that. We, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And we're going to do it that way every day. And then you just reinforce it with positive feedback when they do it correctly. And then you, you know, you, there's things that have to take place when you don't do it correctly. Um, you know, kind of uh, accountability reminders uh, that this is how we're going to do things. And if you don't, then there's consequences to that. Yeah, we saw a picture that after you were uh, hired here and people were really excited about, it, of course, we saw yeah. the picture of uh, the list of guys yeah. at LSU and said, hey, NFL scouts now. I have to ask it. So well, how did those guys react? Okay, that's you know what? That's a, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so for years – well, so that, that this story goes way back. So uh, when I took the job at the University of Miami, um, I would hear the players talk about stuff that they were going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But their actions were totally opposite of that. And it was all about going – and every collegiate football player, every – I was a little kid, and I fell asleep every night with a football in my hand. I thought I was going to play in the NFL. So anybody that gets to this level has a realistic opportunity to make an NFL roster. Uh, but your, if your actions say one thing and your mouth says another, then you're not ever going to make it. So what I did is I put a sign in the window at the University of Miami first, and it had a very positive influence on those guys. Um, and then when I got to LSU, I started doing it. So that particular sign, um, because that was something that we kept in-house. And so I would take it down every night when I left to go to work because that was something only for our athletes to see and not the general public. So I had uh, a, a director from another department come to me one day and say, hey, I need help with these guys. I'm asking them to do something, and they refuse to do it. Can you help me? And I was reluctant to doing it at first because I wanted to make sure I was sending the right message to the team. So 
he finally talked me into putting those guys' names on that board that I had or a piece of paper. And so that afternoon after work, I didn't take it down. And it was, unfortunately for those guys, that wasn't a strength and conditioning list. Mm. That was a list from uh, another department within the football program. And so uh, the next day we were playing Alabama and there was a weight room tour and a lady saw that picture, took it and put it on Facebook. So I was embarrassed for those guys uh, because that was done uh, and that it was my fault and I should have never done it, uh, but I did. And so that's, but I apologized because somebody sent me a copy of that. And I apologized to each one of those guys publicly and through social media. And every time, like when you asked me the question, I apologized to those guys as well because that list wasn't a strength and conditioning oh, okay. list, and I got burned. Uh, but now, when I did put that picture, when I did put those guys' names on it for strength and conditioning, not one of them ever said a word to me because they knew why their name went on that. And that was the best form of punishment that I had ever used was because everybody's goal is to make it to the NFL. And when the scouts, I would tell them, when the scouts come and ask me about you, I'm telling them the truth because if, if I don't tell them the truth and they get burned, then they're never going to take my word on any other player ever again. And so I was always very honest with every NFL scout that came into my office. And when there was something good that I could say about someone, I would say it. And if there was something that I felt the NFL scouts needed to know about a particular player, I would say it. But now I never commented on academics. I never commented on uh, departments like the training room or the equipment room that I had no say so over. Whenever I talk to NFL scouts, I talk only about when they're in the weight room. And so I think by being honest like that and letting the players know what my message is going to be beforehand, it's always been positive. Like Coach Moffa, we got to... Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we have about a minute and a half left. I just want to ask you, in this new world of college football, where I believe head coaches have to evolve with the times, right? right. You strike me as old school slash new school, where yeah. you do bring in the science um, that a lot of the old fitness guys did not get into, but you also keep that mindset of, let's grind, let's go. Yes, that is correct. Um, Take me through that, that mindset. Yeah, so... Um, Long ago, you know, 34, 35 years ago when I started, everything was done on experience and intuition uh, and, and knowledge of what was available. There was no Internet then, so uh, you either got it in firsthand conversations or you had to send a check or a money order somewhere and buy a book. Uh, I remember buying a book from Budapest, Hungary at one time, and I sent a check over with, you know, filled out a little order form, and it took a month and a half to get the book back. But today, that data that we get is uh, immediately available as soon as the workout is complete. Yesterday, we were outside running, and uh, uh, our, one of our uh, anal data analytic people had a TV screen, and I could see what was going on in real time about the distances and velocities that we were hitting while we were doing our workout. So every time a Texas A&M Aggie player comes to the weight room or goes outside to us to run or practice, we measure it. Uh, so I tell them every time you wiggle, we collect that data and then we analyze it. So, um, you know, we finish every day with an hour-long staff meeting where we go over all the analytics immediately following the workout. So now the things that we do are evidence-based, they're data-driven, and then we use our experience and our intuition to make those hard decisions. But it takes all of the guesswork out of it. Like I know exactly how – because 
I have two former Duke strength coaches on my staff, one who worked for me at LSU, and then Brandon Stiegel, who came with Coach Elko with us. So those guys know the distances, velocities, accelerations, and decelerations that Coach Elko is going to do in his very first football practice. So we're planning. We go back. You know, we reverse engineer what that first practice is going to be like, and then we prescribe the exact number of accelerations, decelerations, distance, velocities, and times that are needed to make it through that first practice. So it's it's pretty neat. Like, we have a running total each week that we're supposed to, and it's even broke down. So this week we were at 45% of the distance that is required to make it through the first hard practice at 7,200 yards. And then we do 40% of that distance on Tuesday, and then we do 60% of that distance on Friday, plus all the accelerations. We have at sprint bands, so we know how many sprints they're going to do at 70, 75%, 80, 85%, 90, and all the way up of their max velo. So we just make sure that we hit those data points during our practice and we're good to go. Coach Moffitt, this was wonderful. I wish I could have you for a whole hour, but uh, appreciate your time for coming over. OB, great job. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll talk to you soon, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. All right. We'll be back here on Texax Radio.
his phone number? All right, we are back here on Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are in the Rollo Insurance Studio in Houston, Texas. Um, so we had a, a we, we've never in the three years of doing this show uh, had to combine breaks, but unfortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for the audience, we had to do it uh, because Coach Moffitt has some great wisdom and uh, that was wonderful. So we love talking to Coach Moffitt. I hope many of you got something out of that. I could have talked to him for a full hour. Uh, so excited about his time here at Texas A&M, what the, uh, the team's going to look like. But let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline because our friend Chris Gordy uh, from iHeartRadio, and uh, he is right now at the Senior Bowl. We were thinking about going to the Senior Bowl, but Gordy's like, nah, I get Radio Row to myself. We go to the hotline, and there he is, Chris Gordy. How are you, sir? Hey, what's going on, David? Good to, uh, good to be here, man. How's the uh, atmosphere out there? It's uh, it's intense as always. I mean, it's it's so funny. The uh, you know the the national team has a couple of Florida guys, but the the American team has become basically like it's it's seventy percent SEC guys. So it's so funny because it's a lot of guys that you're very familiar with. I got to interview Anaya Smith yesterday, and uh, you know he even said there's a lot of familiarity because it's guys you've either played with or against or literally gone up against with some of these you know SEC DBs. So. It's um, look, competition breeds breeds excellence, and uh, we're seeing a lot of that uh, so far through just one day of practice at the Senior Bowl. Talking to Chris Gordy here on uh, Tech Sags Radio. Chris, let's uh, talk to Nia Smith. I saw a couple of videos pop up of him yesterday, and uh, he just looks like that explosive player that he always has been. Uh, what are you hearing when it comes to Anias? Yeah, it's funny. Um, it, he had a couple drops, so you know it, it wasn't the best of day for him when he when he catches the ball. Yeah, it's it's the explosiveness, and it's funny because I asked him. I said, you know, you're a guy who started as a running back, converted to receiver. You've been one of the best receivers, you know, when healthy in in the SEC. And, and you know, I think size doesn't matter anymore. I mean, you look at Tank Dell last year coming out of University of Houston. Like it used to be, you want a receiver, you want somebody who's six three, six four, can stretch the field. But now it's like it's all about moving the chains in the NFL and, and you just want possession guys. You want guys who can play the slot, who who can guarantee you to move the chains. And I think there was definitely a role for Anaya Smith. But I asked him, I said, what are you hearing from some of the coaches and scouts you've talked to about, you know, what position would be best for you? He said, honestly, they all ask me that. He said, they've been asking me, where do you see yourself? Like where? Because he's such a hybrid. He's such a a mismatch that I think NFL teams are excited to get their hands on them and see how they can use them. So, you know, he, he admitted to me, he said, like, you know, one of the best of day, days for me, but he said, the best thing is you get to go out there, you know, today, tomorrow, Friday. So uh, plenty of time to still go out there and make a name for himself. And I will remind people tank Dell had a rough first day when I was out here uh, last year at the time. So, um, but excited to see a nice Smith, man. I, I do think he, there was a role for him. And I think, uh, you know, whatever NFL team he ends up on, he's going to have a big impact. Talking to Chris Gordy here on Texas Radio. Uh, Chris McKinley Jackson's a name about a year ago. Senior Bowl folks were tweeting about him, right? They were talking about how this is a guy. Um, how did last season affect him? And is he still one of those hot names that you hear scouts talking about? Yeah, he had a couple moments yesterday where he was pushing guys around. I don't know if you saw there was one video clip where he literally threw a guy to the ground and it was, um, it was awesome to see. So yeah, he's, he's freakish. It, it's funny the a lot of the, the Texas guys are getting attention to Vondre sweat for, from the Texas Longhorns is a guy that he's just a freak. When you look at him, he's so big and menacing. And, you know, some people said maybe, you know, he'll translate. He's just like a two down lineman at the next level, but a, a really ferocious force. Uh, and then there's a couple guys from the university of Houston, Nelson Caesar, who's, who's catching some attention, but, uh, McKinley Jackson was another one everybody was talking about yesterday. It's funny. I was talking to a friend. I said, well, what is it? It's all the, all the Texas university guys are all the ones making, making noise yesterday, but no McKinley is, is so big and physical. And again, just was I imposing his will on a, a couple of the O-linemen. What was so fun, David, yesterday, it, it, the, the trench battles they had when there was O-linemen versus D-linemen one-on-one, they, uh, it, it gathered such a crowd. It was about 10 people deep of GM scouts, coaches, all just watching these guys go to battle because, you know, it, it, all the focus, like they're normally all working out where it's like all the different position groups and all this at one time, everybody kind of stopped what they do, what they were doing and just focused on the trench battles because it got that intense. But yeah, it's, it's funny. The, a couple of the A&M guys really turned some heads yesterday and, and McKinley Jackson was one of them.
Layden Robinson, a guy that, you know, a couple years ago, I thought he'd be a, you know, top three round pick. Uh, had a couple rough seasons the Aggie offensive line did. Are, are you feeling that he can move up based on this week? Yeah, I thought he looked okay yesterday watching him. It didn't. He didn't do anything that, that made me, you know, uh, uh, th- think that he's in over his head. But you're right. That was a guy who was so th- highly thought of. And, yeah, we thought, you know, when he first got to A&M, yeah, that's a future first-round pick. And, uh, you know, I guess kind of speaks to the issues that A&M's had the last couple of years is – you had all these great four and five star highly touted old linemen, and they just all haven't developed w- into what you kind of were hoping for. Um, you know, you thought that would be the strength, especially of a, a Jimbo Fisher coach team that that old line is going to be strong up front and they're going to run the ball, um, you know, at will. But no, Layden Robinson, I, I, I like him. Um, I'll keep an eye out, out on him today and see uh, see what he's able to do. But yeah, he's he's again. He looks the part. You look at him, you go, "That's that's an awful offensive lineman right there." But um, yeah, I, I uh, it, it's funny. There's a lot of a lot of SEC linemen out here as well. There's a couple guys from. There's a guy from LSU. There's a, a guy from Kentucky. I mean, it's just funny to you look up and you see all the helmets across the line. It's like, and basically like an all SEC line, uh, one you know from from left to right. Gordy, I know you weren't able to listen because you were doing stuff at the Senior Bowl, but we had. Uh a great interview just a few minutes ago with Tommy Moffat, the new strength and conditioning coach. I know you're familiar with him. I keep thinking to myself what those three players and the two that are are going to the uh, East West shrine game could look like with his tutelage, just your thoughts on what he can bring to Texas A&M as a guy who watched so much LSU. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, you got to add the muscle. You got to add the strength. Uh, When you get into the grind of an sec schedule, you know, we, we've seen time te- at times teams get out physical and, and you get pushed around when, when Tommy Moffitt is your strength coach. They he preps you for that grind. I mean, we've seen that through multiple different. He- there, there's a reason why he was at LSU through multiple head coaches. People thought he that highly of him that, you know, he was that good. His offseason program is one of the best. You will really start to see. Guys put on the weight. The one guy I always go back to, and and we saw it almost immediately because he was on campus when I was at campus. Uh, Laron Landry from LSU. When he came in as a freshman, he was built like a like a grown up. I mean, when you saw him walk in, you're like, that guy's a freshman. But the amount of muscle and and conditioning that that he went through in his from his freshman to his sophomore year, and then from his sophomore to his junior year, it's all because of Tommy Moffat and and the weight training program he put a guy like that on um, and, and really the LSU O-line and D-line. That's where, uh, you know, Tommy Moffitt's going to have his focus and get those guys ready to go. Uh, look at all these great wide receivers that have come through LSU over the years from Odell Beckham, the Jarvis Landry, all, all these guys, Tommy Moffitt was the guy working one-on-one with them, uh, you know, all throughout the off season. And I, I don't know how many people realize it, but like this time of year, you know, before they start spring ball, the coaches aren't talking with these guys every day. There's one guy that these guys are talking to every day, and that's the strength coach. And that's that's going to be Tommy Moffitt's uh, role at A&M. And, yeah, everybody I've talked to at LSU, they, they get it. You know, sometimes things run its course and it's time to move on. But I think it's funny seeing what Brian Kelly's doing now. He's bringing back a lot of the guys that they let go. Corey Raymond. They brought back Frank Wilson. They're bringing back this guy and that guy. And it's like I think they will look back on it a year or two from now and go, man, did we do make the right move there, letting uh, Tommy Moffat go? Because I think you're going to see very improved trench play from a and I think you'll see it almost immediately next year with under Mike Elko. Talking to Chris Gordy, Locked On SEC. You can find that on the Locked On Network. He is at the Senior Bowl, a name that um, obviously had a huge rise the last two years, Michael Penix. What's the buzz about him here at, at, at camp? And can he – he's not one of the names, interestingly, that you hear when you talk about the top three, four quarterbacks, but he should be and could be. Yeah, it's a big, big week for him. Um, I've heard if he has a great week, and, and by the way, he had a good day yesterday. He's a guy that could sneak into the back end of the first round. Look, this is this is a very quarterback heavy draft, and it's a quarterback needy draft. There's a lot of teams that need quarterbacks. It's funny you look at the the three teams with the top three picks. You know, the Bears, the Commanders, the Patriots. All three of those teams are probably going to go quarterback. Uh, then you're talking about the Falcons sitting there, what, uh, around the top 10 somewhere. They need a quarterback. The, as you get down the back stretch, there's teams that are going to make moves to to climb back into the back end of that, of that first round to grab a quarterback. And so, yeah, it's uh, some of the mocks I've seen, Penix second, maybe even third round. But 
I've, people I talked to yesterday said, no, they do not discount back into the first. Somebody could come back and get and get Penix. The biggest fear on him is age, right? He's 24, so that clock's already ticking. He's older than most of the, the NFL rookies last year. He's older than C.J. Stroud and all these guys. So, um, you know, whoever takes him, he's almost like plug and play. We got to start him from day one. He's got to get out there and be the guy. Uh, but I, I look at it right now, David. Like, I look at the Steelers team and go, God, Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky, like, I would take Michael Penix over anybody on their roster right now. So there's some teams that I think will be interested in him. But yeah, all eyes are on him. I thought, like I said, I thought he had a good day yesterday. Uh, throws a bullet. I mean, you watch him all throughout the year at Washington. I mean, th the guy was just nails. Made every throw that he needed to. And so, yeah, it's a big week for him. It's a big week for Bo Nix. You know, another guy that that was once thought of as a you know top half of the first round. So. Uh, if both those guys have good weeks, look, we saw it, you know, Dak Prescott years ago, yeah. he had an awesome senior bowl week and started climbing up everybody's draft boards. So we'll see if Penix can do that this week. So if you search senior bowl on Twitter or on X, whatever they call it, uh, you'll see a lot of videos on lad McConkey. I hear he had a great day. Talk a little bit about some of the, the catches he was making and just the buzz around him. Yeah, it's funny. It, uh, between him and Cody Schrader from Missouri, it was a huge day for athletic white guys at the Senior Bowl. They, uh, you know, not not used to seeing the the white running back and the white wide receiver go off, but both those guys had had fantastic days. Uh, no, Lad McConkey's is just an incredible route runner. I mean, that was the one thing one of the scouts I was standing next to yesterday goes, "Look at that route." I mean, the footwork, uh, the speed, the agility. We know he wasn't 100 percent on the back stretch of the season. Him and Brock Bowers both gutted it out in the the SEC championship, but you know, look, they, they weren't healthy. Uh, but when Lad McConkey is healthy, he is super, super quick. Uh, you know, like I said, runs a clean route and, and can get open. And I think teams, teams definitely noted that yesterday. So yeah, not only him, the Florida wide receiver, Ricky Parasol, he's on the national team. He had a nice day yesterday too. caught everything thrown his way in one on one seven on sevens. So yeah, I, I hate to be, you know, Mr. SEC biased here, but like, I'm sorry, the SEC guys all look great yesterday. Cody Schrader looked the best of all the running backs. I, I think, you know, it, it's funny. Somebody asked a comp on Christian McCaffrey. I'm like, why do we do that? Just cause he's white. Like we got to go with, Oh, he's, you know, white running back. Um, but no Schrader runs hard, man. And, and what I love too, David is they blow the whistle like on contact here. They're not bringing them to the ground yet but they ask him to finish out the runs that dude runs as hard, like from <laughs> finishing the run and he runs all the way to the end zone, like runs just as hard as if he were in an sec game against Georgia or something. So yeah, I, I, keep an eye on Cody Schrader, keep an eye on Lad McConkey. Those are two guys who I think are going to be big risers this week. Chris, isn't there one of the wide receivers there that's like six, seven, six, eight? That's just out of this world. Am I am I making that up? I feel like I saw some tweets about just a giant man running. Yeah, I'd have to go look at it. I heard people talking yesterday. I thought they were talking about a defensive back. But you're probably right. It might have been a, a wide receiver, but it, size doesn't matter. Like you know, like I said, a nice Smith is is small and undersized. Dejon Edwards from Georgia. I was surprised seeing him in person. How how undersized he looked in in you know after seeing him on TV. Uh, but Tavondre Sweat from Texas is just like, you look at that dude and he's just menacing. I mean, he's, he's monster. Somebody told me though, they're like, he's, they think he's going to be a two down lineman. And normally like in the NFL, you don't like, you don't draft high on that, but you look, look at um, who was my guy, Jordan Davis out of Georgia that went to the Philadelphia Eagles. He's basically a two down lineman, but he's a disruptor. If he can eat up the run on, on first and second down, that's what you need out of that guy. So yeah, again, you know, contrary to popular belief size, Sometimes doesn't matter, David. Hey, now, Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Hey, uh, Rollo Insurance Studio. What about the Tennessee investigation? Is that a hot topic there, or are people staying away from that because it is about you know, young men's NFL future? But that's that's got to be a hot button issue out there. Yeah, what I love about being out here, David, is it's a, it's such a conglomeration, a mix of college and pro people. Like I was standing next to Andy Staples. He had to leave to go take a call to you know to go find out more on the, on this Tennessee thing. So it's just kind of funny. It's like, you got pros, you got college, you got all this mix of people, but I, I think it's a dangerous territory we're heading down. I mean, look, everyone, I think everyone can agree right now. They have no, most people, majority of America doesn't care that players get paid. Right? Like, so let's get past that stigma. Uh, but when I'm hearing the words, like uh, what, what was it? Pat 40 said like, Oh, this is uh this is a, uh, egregious uh, and all this. I'm like, can we like, no one cares. Fans don't care anymore. <laughs> like the, the whole uh, stigma of, Oh, you paid a player. 
who cares? Like, it, get over it. You open this door in allowing NIL and not regulating it enough that it, it's you're going to have this uh, thing where you can go through, um, you know, the the different outlets that that provide the money, and it's not it's not just the school. So, you know, from what I heard, the the script in um, the the agreement that Nico Yamaliava signed with the uh, with the group uh, the, at Tennessee, it does not say that he has to play quarterback at Tennessee. It just says like it would be in your better interest signing this marketing deal. If you lived in, in or around Knoxville, Tennessee, like it kind of hints at it, but like there's no verbiage in there. When the lawyers go to work, they will say there's nothing in here that says we paid him to come play quarterback at Tennessee. And so I just think it's a real sticky road. The NCAA is going down. And from the reports, they said, Oh, they're coming after everybody. Good. Then if you go after everybody, then I think, Everybody's going to push back and you're going to we're getting closer and closer to an exit from the NCAA because I think, you know, conferences like the SEC and, I, and I'm really interested to see what Greg Sankey will say. Right. Because this is now two schools. This is Florida under investigation from the Jaden Rashada recruitment and now Tennessee. If a few more SEC schools come out here, I think it, it's imperative that Greg Sankey gets out and goes, hey, NCAA chill the bleep out. We've already warned you we're, we're, you know, we could leave uh, an exit in the next couple of years and go do our own thing independently. Um, you know, as my buddy, Chris Marler said yesterday, when the college football playoff committee came out and said, yeah, the, uh, the cheating scandal at Michigan did not factor in at all in our decisions. Then what are we doing here? Then, then like (laughs) the college football playoff committee is telling you they don't care about it. So why is the NCAA the only one focused on, well, we got to dig into this stuff again. Nobody cares. The players are getting paid how you do it, you know, within the realms of the rules or whatever, look, rules have always been bent. So to get all up in arms of this, I I just think this is the start of a snowball that we're going to see more and more schools. The NCAA try to come down on and, Hey, NCA, I think you're digging your own grave right now. Talking to Chris Gordy here on Texas. Last thing for you, uh, Chris. Who do you think in the SEC, and you can give me two, three teams, won the offseason, like somebody who either is going to sustain what they've had, get better than what they had, or maybe even like an AM who completely changed the culture, uh, bringing in Mike Elko and also brought in some quality talent. Yeah, it's it's so funny that, you know, Ole Miss grabs all the headlines because of what they did through the portal. And, you know, for a couple of days there, AM jumped them. And then, you know, Ole Miss gets a couple more guys, gets Trey Amos from Alabama, and suddenly they go back to the number one transfer class. But uh I, I think that kind of woke a lot of people up when AM jumped to number one there for a couple of days and people went, wait, wait, AM. And so you start looking at what they brought in. And it's maybe not the big flashy names that Ole Miss br- br- is bringing in. But it's a lot of guys, you dress a lot of needs. And I think, you know, it's all about chemistry. You got to bring it all together. We saw two years ago, LSU was able to do that. And you're one of Brian Kelly. They they gelled. Everything came came together and they won the SEC West. Uh, Last year at Auburn, it didn't come all together. It took them a few weeks for these old linemen all click. The quarterback never really clicked. So it's hit and miss. It's much like recruiting. But uh, I do like what Elko's done. I think they're kind of sneaky. I think a and the, the quiet team kind of waiting in the weeds that, yeah, keep showing all that love to Ole Miss. Keep showing all that love to Alabama and all these other schools. And I think a and going to sneak up and su- surprise some people. It would not shock me, David, if some things fell the Aggies way. We'll, we'll see what they do in the non-conference game against Notre Dame if they win that one. I mean, I don't want to put this pressure on him, but 10 wins is possible. Nine and three would probably be what I would say would be a, a fantastic year for Elko in year one. But man, if, if things fall their way, I, I talked with an eye Smith yesterday. I said, I said, who are you most excited about next year? Without hesitation, he goes, Connor Wegman. He goes, I think, I think he is ready and primed to bust out and people maybe forgot about him with the injury, but yeah, I, I think A&M is, is really that team in the SEC that, that people aren't talking enough about. Mr. Gordy, we appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, David. Later, buddy. Chris Gordy there. Uh, iHeartRadio, and of course, uh, he does SEC podcast, and uh, that's on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with Coach Pat Henry in studio right now. A moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet Highway 21 in Caldwell online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. It is a great place to go when you're looking for a vehicle. So when you're looking for a vehicle, and I know many of you are, or you might have teenagers that are getting close to that age and like, well, I just, you know, I got to get something safe. I got to get, you know, something affordable and I got to do this and I got to do that. Why don't you start your search there at CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com? You start there, you see what they have. And then when you go on the lot and you talk to the folks out there, you're going to be like, all right, Nuno wasn't lying to me. The the customer service is better than any other place out there. The pricing and the selection is phenomenal. And then the service afterwards, 
beats everybody. They got complimentary pickup for their service customers. They are the place to go when it comes to getting your vehicle called Wall Country Chevrolet. I did it. Billy has done it. Ronnie's done it. We've all done it. Uh, Coach R.C. Slocum has done it many times. Dante Hall's done it. It is the place to go. It's about a 15-minute drive. Brought a call while a short conversation away. But you will see the difference when you step on a lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 and Caldwell online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. All right, we're back here on Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio, and it is now time for our conversation, our weekly conversation with Coach Pat Henry, brought to you by Brazos Running Company, your local Aggie-owned specialty running store. Save 10% in-store when you mention the code TEXACS10 and check out the new location at Century Square. Coach Henry, how are you, sir? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. Sorry yeah. I'm not there in studio with you, but uh, I'll be back here next week. Let's let's talk about the, the final home meet coming up and, of course, looking back at the Razorback Invitational. I guess we can start there. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of great finishes for your for your team. Yeah, we had a real, real good meet. Uh, we had two new school records there with uh, Heather Abadie in the pole vault at, and Cooper Cothran in, in the mile, ran 359. Cooper uh, had a great race. Heather jumped 14-4. Uh, but we had a lot of really good efforts, and uh, if you wanted me to go down those, I would. But if you wanted sure. to just talk about some of the well, Ahmad Robinson ran 46-1, uh, um, which is one of the top times in the country in the, in the 400 meters. 
uh, we had two two half miters hit hit it pretty good this weekend too. Uh, Farkas went, ran his first race at 147 plus, and then Bailey Goggins, who's had a, had a tough year and a half, uh, came back. Uh, she's Texan, ran 203 at 800 meters. 800 meters. Jermisha Arnold, our female quarter miter, miter, ran 52 seconds. I think one of the great one, great runs of the weekend. That's probably not uh, well. We hadn't talked about it as much as as maybe the mile or or the pole vault just because they were new school records. But Connor Schulman and Jaqueline Scott uh, both ran 768 in the in the short in the 60 hurdles. That's number three and four time ever run at Texas A and M, and between them was a thousandth of a second. Uh, so uh, Connor's still saying he's the best guy out of the two. Uh, by a thousandth uh, but uh, to run that fast this early uh, they both look real good right now and then jean Thomas uh, in the multi-event uh, put up one of the better scores we've ever had here in a and too so we had a really good weekend that's some of it and we had some other things but uh, like you said it's after our our third competition and uh, we're starting some things are starting to come together well, as we were preparing for the show, I was talking to Eric, and uh, he actually brought up an, at a very interesting point to talk a little bit about Cooper, not only breaking that mile school uh, record, but also laying a blueprint for the next wave of distance athletes. If you can touch on that, because that's a high mark to set. Yeah, um, but he had a he had a freshman, um, Andre Gatos, right behind him at 402, one of our new freshmen. Um you know, times, they're after those times. They're, they're, you know, those, those young guys, they don't, uh, they don't look at it any different than a guy who's been here two or three years. Uh, Andre is, is after that time. And, and next time they line up, they're going to be trying to beat each other. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we have a good, good distance group come in. We have two new guys that started with us this week as well. Um, one ran uh, what eight oh five? Yep, eight oh five for Victor. For Victor, um, and then we ran eight twenty six or eight twenty seven. I think at, uh, at both of those guys at three k. Both of them are brand new. Uh, one of them's a transfer from UTEP, who was uh, third last year in the steeplechase at the NCAA championships. So he can run. Um, the new guy that came in along with him. Uh, but is a new freshman, you know, I don't talk very much about freshmen, but, uh, I, you, know, you know, he's not in very good shape. He came in in January, so uh, we'll see where he can get by the time indoors over. But he, he is a very, very talented uh, guy, young, young one, uh, miter, uh, that can step up and, and can run any distance. So he's, he's going to be a great addition. How much better of an athlete can you become when you travel to these conditions where maybe you're not comfortable, you don't know the uh, the yeah. course as well as you know some other places, and have to grind through that? Well, it's about the level of competition. Uh, you know, the when when you get to a competition like this, and as many good athletes line up at the same spot, just like here, just like here this weekend coming in, there's gonna be, it's gonna be a great lineup of people that are here it's it's a good things happen in a competitive environment uh when it's not competitive good things don't happen um it's like any sport you know i mean if you are uh if you're if you're a good team any team and the level of competition is not good for you uh you don't play well either you don't run well you don't throw you don't do anything well when the level of competition is not good. So the better the competition, the better everybody does, and and that's what this. You, I, we could run in mud every once in a while. It doesn't have to be a great track. Somebody'd run fast, you know. And it's about it's about beating each other. Let's get uh, Eric Asars to ask a couple of questions. Eric, take it away. Yeah, coach. Is there any specific event group that maybe is not quite where you would like them to be at this moment, but you know deep down when the season matters the most, they're going to be ready to go? Well, I. Uh, you know, our 400-meter group right now is we're, we're trying to – I'm looking at a bunch of different people, except on the ladies' side. And we have one that's hurt, one that's coming back this week. Um, 
Uh, Jaden Wood will be back on the track this weekend, so our, our female team will be a, a little bit more secure. Uh, but our men's team, we really have eight guys that are running really close together. And although Ahmad stepped out this weekend and ran 46-1, um, you know, it's a competitive environment. And I'm lining the groups up. I haven't necessarily lined up the best four on the A group and, and or the B group. I, I haven't done that yet. I hope to get a little closer to doing that because what ends up happening, I end up putting the four guys on the track in, in both relays, and I get two of the best times on each of the, each of the relays. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a little bit of a roll of the dice right now. Um, competitiveness, this is a young group of guys, um, but it's a returning group. Uh, this group ran three flat, 3-0, 3-0 last year at the national championships for these guys. Any time you're running like that, and, and those were three freshmen on their sophomores, those are those are, I mean that that's getting after it. And we're going to run well. I think it's just getting the act together a little bit right now and figuring out it. That, that's my fault right now because I hadn't put the right four on the track at the same time. And and moving on to like the the distance side of things. Obviously, we had we talked about Cooper Cother breaking this mile school record. We had Bailey Goggins. Had a 203-800. Yeah. Uh, but talk a little bit about Sam Withmarsh. We know he's going to be uh, opening up this season. So how excited are you looking forward to his debut? Yeah, you know, Sam is Sam is one of the better half miles we've ever had at Texas A&M. And Sam, Sam's had some little injuries, had a foot problem. Uh, I mean, Sam's had just about everything go wrong with him you could possibly go wrong with him, uh, including, including a heart surgery. Um, so he, he's had everything go wrong. Um, but he's healthy now, and I'm looking forward to this race with him this weekend. It's going to be interesting to see how he how he competes, and, and he's a great competitor. Now, we'll see who lines up and, and who's ready to run with him. Uh, but right now, it's just about Sam getting a good race in. That's all it's about because Sam is such a competitor that uh, – I'm not worried about it. When he gets in, in in a in a better race, maybe than this weekend, he's he'll be ready to run. That is our weekly conversation with Coach Pat Henry, brought to you by the Brazos Running Company. Coach Henry, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. You know, before I yes, sir, go ahead. Before, I brought because I thought you were in studio, so I brought this for you. And what is that? I'm going to leave it here. Um, it's a piece of the the new track, okay, and. We have a, a medallion that we've put in the middle of it, and uh, we're giving some of these out, and it's the R.A. Murray Faskin track, and this is the, the opening of this. This is the dedication of it. This, this uh, facility is, is Friday. Uh, we have a function on Friday morning. And we're giving out a bunch of these things, and they're basically to put a cup of hot coffee on or, or, or whatever, and I'm going to leave it right here on the desk for you. Coach Henry, you're the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll text you after the show, let you know what's going on while right. I'm not there. But uh, I appreciate everything you do. That is very kind of you, and yeah, I will talk you to you soon. You bet. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Come out to the Thank meet you. this weekend, folks. You'll, have, you'll really enjoy it. There he is, Coach Pat Henry here on Texas Radio. Right now, we're going to hit a break, but I want to talk about Heritage Films. That is Chance McLean's company. The website is yourheritagefilm.com. They make documentary films about awesome moments in life. Coach Henry's talking about the facility. Well, how about Chance and his group doing that? Or whatever you have going on important in your life. That's what Chance does. He tells people stories. He tells grandfather stories. He tells grandparents stories, mother, uncle, your boss. He tells family ranch stories, family business stories. You name it, that's what Chance does, and he does it for everyday people. You don't got to be a famous person to get a documentary done about, about your life or your father's life. It could be about everyday Joes who just have an awesome story to tell. And by the way, you have an awesome story to tell. We all have great stories to tell, and that's why I highly recommend you check out Chance McLean and Heritage Films. He can also do the year flicks, which are these 20-minute videos, Q&A style, where they ask the questions for a high school senior entering their freshman year. Q&A, 20 minutes. Just get to know the kids on a different level. I think you would be so, so happy with it all. It is Heritage Films and the Year Flicks. The uh, website is yourheritagefilm.com. 
yourheritagefilm.com, All right, it is Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is time to talk a little basketball. We're going to go to the Brian Foley hotline. Good people can have a bad day. Call Brian Foley Law at 936-596-0407. Serving Houston, the Woodlands, Conroe, and the Brazos Valley. And with that, we go to the coach, Tom Schubert, here on the program. Tom, how are you, sir? Good morning, David. Doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. So tell me why. Why do I not need to panic? Because I'm close to panicking, Tom. I'm very close to panicking. Well, based on what we've seen the last two, three years with A&M, I, I never count them out. And I think that's why we're a dangerous team. But at the same time, never count us in. I mean, uh, it's hard to predict uh, the outcome of ball games when Texas A&M plays just because of maybe our inconsistency and then I think our inability to shoot the ball consistently uh, throughout this season has been our biggest, uh, you know, negative. Yeah, it is the biggest negative, but I'll tell you what, Tom, like you're taking on a Florida team this week and they're going to be taking on this Florida team who seems to be rising, right? Uh, you you have to win the games, especially at home against the teams uh, you, you, it's great to beat Kentucky at home. That's phenomenal. They need more of that. It's great to go on the road and beat LSU. But you got to win the games at home that are in front of you, especially the winnable games. And I find the, a Florida game, it should be winnable if you're a, a championship-level team or, excuse me, a tournament-level team. Sure. 
Uh, especially when you only play a team once, David. You know, like we lost to Ole Miss uh, last week. And, you know, we've got a return game there at the end of the year. So you can make up for that. When you're playing good ball clubs in a, in a Power 5 conference, if you can split with good teams, I think you feel pretty good. Unless you're that elite, you know, maybe one or two teams in the country where you expect to, you know, win every night out. So this is really a must game in that we don't have a chance to go down to Florida and uh, make up for it like we did in the LSU loss. So I, I see it's going to be a great game. You know, Florida's looking at it. They're still not considered to be a tournament team by many people's account. So they feel like if they can get a road win against a good A&M team, that's going to help their resume. So I think it's going to be a battle. The other thing about Florida, they're so similar to us in some ways. Uh, I looked up the stats today. I know we're the number one offensive rebounding team in the country, and Florida's right behind us about two less as the second team. And then Florida's the number one rebounding team in the country, and we're number two. So it should be a great battle. The one thing I don't like about Florida for our matchup is that they're a balanced team. They have five guys averaging double figures. And my experience in watching the Aggies, those are the teams that seem to give us trouble. I, I like when we play a team that has one or two superstars. Uh, Buzz does a great job of usually taking those guys out of the game and making other people beat you. In this particular case, Florida has five guys that average double figures or experience. They shoot the ball well. And uh, so they're a tough matchup. Talking to Tom Schubert here on Tex Ags Radio. Earlier in the show, Tom, we went through some of these stats, and it's amazing when Wade and Boots go off, you would think that's a good thing, right? But the, the team actually suffers when those two are the biggest chunk of the offense. They need a, an entire offensive performance uh, to beat these teams. At least that's what the stats say. Correct. Uh, you know, I look a lot of times like leading scorers in the country, Dave, and a lot of times you'll think, man, if you have – one of the top leading scorers in the country will have a good team. Ironically, it's almost the exact opposite. You know, you have a guy that gets a lot of points. Sometimes their records are not really good. Uh, in our case, when Boots and uh, Wade get a lot of points, it's usually out of necessity. You know, maybe we're struggling. Um, again, as, as, when I was coaching, the teams that I feared the most were balanced teams, teams that understood their role. They obviously relied on their best offensive players in crunch time like we do with Wade, which you, what you should do. But the teams that win consistently and are usually tournament teams are teams that have balance. You very, very seldom see a team make the tournament and they don't have a lot of balance. Uh, I, I remember a couple years ago when Georgia rolled in here, or actually it was last year, with the number one pick in the NBA draft, Edwards had a horrible game. I mean, Georgia was not a good basketball team, had the number one pick in the country. We totally shut them down. Now the guys, you know, going off in the NBA. But um, so, yes, we're a team that I think other teams fear because we are balanced, although we've got an elite player in Wade Taylor. And when he's on, he's on. And when he's off, he's even on at the crunch time. And that's what makes us so dangerous. We can always come back. What do you think can, or I mean, we're trying to spread the wealth out there. Anderson Garcia has been great. Uh, Henry's got his moments of being great. And then, you know, he's coming back from injury. Where else can some of that offensive punch come from? Well, I would like to see someone get more consistent shooting the ball. And, uh, you know, uh, you look at those guys and you look at their numbers from years past at other programs, they can shoot the ball. But so much of shooting is confidence and in timing. And it's not that you have to shoot the ball so consistent every game. It's those timely shots. And I'd love to see Chase Carter just get get on the get on a roll. I know he's capable. Uh, I listen to Buzz talk and, and and Chase does a tremendous job of defending and rebounding. I, I love him in that aspect. But I think he's capable of being that guy that you can't leave open or you can't forget about that can beat you. And hopefully he can come into that role. Again, it's uh, I think so much has to do with confidence and consistent minutes. And I know uh, Carter is playing many more minutes later in the year than he had been early. Tom, I keep hitting this point, and um, you're a coach, so tell me if you agree. I think AM is at their best offensively when they get out and run because it means two things. A, the defense, which is usually on point, is playing the lanes, which leads to quicker breaks. And then if they don't settle into the shot clock, right, if they don't wait until five seconds left, I feel that they find a, a much better uh, offensive look as opposed to when they sometimes go to the very end. So if, I, if, I'm, if I'm Buzz and the team, 
I want to play the lanes. I want to get quick buckets. And if not, I still want to attack the rim as quickly as possible. Ex absolutely, David. Uh, you know, Wade Taylor to me, you get him the ball in open court transition. He's almost impossible to stop. He may not make the shot, but he's either going to get fouled or he's going to have a great opportunity to get the ball in the basket. He's so good with his floaters. And then when he's on rhythm, I thought the old Miss game, that was the one game where I felt like he was, you know, ready. I mean, he's always ready, but he was shooting the ball well. I was hoping we could get him a few more clean looks. But again, Ole Miss adjusted. They probably tried to take him out of it. I know late in the game, they were trying to keep the ball out of his hands, but you're exactly right. We're good in transition. You know, we just have to, to stop people or start causing more turnovers, which it seems like we're doing later in the year. We're getting our hands on more balls. We're being a little more aggressive. You know, last year's team defensively, I thought was elite. I thought we did so many great things with the way we switched and just the way we communicated. We had so many uh, great defensive stops. Uh, this year, uh, we're still good defensively, but I don't think we're near as good as we were last year. Again, that's just my opinion. You, you can visit with the coaches. They break down the tapes. They're with them every day. But uh, if we can get out in transition, like you say, it makes us a, a much more dangerous team and a team that uh, can score a lot of points at any given time. Tom, all right, uh, last thing. we got about a minute left. So you think this Florida game, if it goes up, nothing's, you know, if they win this game, they still got a lot of work to do. If they lose this game, are you doubting they make the tournament? I'm just trying to get a sense for where you are based on where we are in the schedule. Well, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask about tournament because I, I like to reward teams that have great years. But I think we're in the tournament if we just don't self-destruct because of our non-conference schedule and how high our net was. I think we can lose the Florida and go, uh, go to Missouri and win. You know, we have two road games this year where we play uh, two teams that haven't won an SEC game yet. I'm sure they're going to beat somebody. I just hope it's not the Aggies. Uh, but if we we need to at least go one and one in these next two games, if we were to drop the next two, I'd be very fearful that the tournament could be something we have to wait for till next year. The great Tom Schubert here on Texas Radio. Tom, great stuff as always. Talk to you next week, buddy. Oh, Thanks. also next week, a week from today is National Signing Day. So we may have to do a whole switcheroo on the schedule. I'll reach out to you, bud. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate you. Tom Schubert here on Texas Radio. Let's do this. Let's hit a break. When we come back, we'll talk to Steve Denton here on the program, a little men's tennis. Right now, 12 under 12. Did you or someone you know graduate from AM within the last 12 years and are leading by example in business and in service? If so, the Association of Former Students wants to invite you to nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. So each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishment, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of AM's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. So previous year honorees have included leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close on Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to nominate someone very soon. To learn more about the recognition and submit a nomination, Visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations.
All right, Texas Radio. Next up is Steve Denton, AM's men's tennis coach this weekend. He picked up his 350th career win against Auburn. They are ranked number 18 in the country, and they just punched their ticket to the ITA Indoor National Championships. Coach Denton, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. How about you, David? Well, thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming to the studio. How was the weekend? Well, it was interesting. Uh, you know, we had to do a lot of pivoting. Uh, got a call at 10 o'clock on Saturday night that uh, – we were going to have to go to Clemson to play indoors because the weather was below 50 degrees. And so I'd already sent the guys off to bed and had to get them up and go over to Clemson. It's about an hour and a half drive. Got an hour on the courts. And then, uh, you know, we played a very good Auburn team that we've been, you know, kind of targeting for a while. And uh, I thought our guys uh, under the conditions and, you know, being able to pivot like they did. I thought our guys did a great job, you know, winning that match 4-2. We started out well in the doubles and continued in the singles. A couple of uh, big SEC wins, too. Obviously, uh, you guys want to be the cream of the crop, and beating teams in the conference is, goes a long way towards your season. It helps a lot. gives us a lot of confidence. Uh, we've started out very well. We, we beat UCLA on the road, and then we obviously were able to beat Auburn and Georgia. Uh, one of the toughest places to play uh, in in college tennis is in Athens. They have big crowds. Um, it's it's a difficult arena. We had to go back and play outdoors the next day uh, in not ideal conditions. Uh, I think I made the comment that that we got for the first time of the season. Uh, we had won the doubles point in the first three matches, but we just got smoked in the doubles uh, uh, early on. Um, they won another match to go up 2-0. And then we really began, you know, to systematically uh, turn that match around. Uh, we've kind of been in lockdown mode, especially at the back of the lineup. I was down with the four, five, and six players, Julio Perego, um, uh, Tiago Perez, who's our, who's our freshman from France, and Luke Casper. And all the three of those guys were, or two of the three won, and the other one was on the brink of winning. So we really did a good job there of, uh, of turning that match around. And different guys have stepped up in different matches for us to be successful. We had about three minutes before the break. Just uh, let's talk about New York. And it's coming up in a couple of weeks and how, how exciting that, that's going to be. Well, it's going to be very good. We're going to play at the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center, which is where the U.S. Open is played, as well as Columbia University, who's the host. And, you know, the top teams in the country are going to be there. Our best suit has not been indoor tennis. Uh, you know, I'd have been fired a long time ago uh, if my indoor record was what was going to uh, – what I was going to be judged by. But uh, I think that – that our guys, this particular team that we have, we have some pretty good indoor players. They're pretty versatile, uh, good athletes, and uh, we've already played two indoor matches this year. So of our four matches, we've gotten a couple, which I think is great for us early in the season because uh, typically we try to play outdoor tennis as much as we can, even in January, February. So I thought, I think going into the tournament, Obviously, we're playing with a lot of confidence, but we're also playing the best teams in the country as well. Got about a minute left here. Uh, SMU coming up uh, afterward, and uh, number 350 for you. What, what did that mean to you? I know that you like to look back at your players, but just getting that number 350. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've had a lot of great players and, and great coaches to help me. So, you know, God's graced me out and given me lots of uh, opportunities being here uh, and uh, – you know, really excited about the fact that this particular team uh, is moving in the right direction. I, I love what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, it's been a real honor to be here and represent the Aggies uh, in such a way. Coach, we appreciate your time. Good luck. Congratulations on 350 and, and ahead. All right, sir? Thank you. Great to talk with you, David. Thank you so much. We'll, get, we'll do it again soon. All right, we'll hit a break here. When we come back on Texas Radio, Ryan Broninger, Recruiting Country. We'll get to your questions and more. It's Texas Radio.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers in the Rollo Insurance Studio. It is now time for Recruiting Country presented by Caprock Health System, a faster patient-centered revolution in care with two ERs in the Bryan College Station area. You got the original 24-hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch and the full-service hospital with an ER in Bryan on Briar Crest online at caprockhealthsystem.com. Without further ado, Ryan Broninger. Ronnie, what up, buddy? Good morning, Nuno. How you been? Uh, I'm oh, I'm good. Uh, number one, I want to ask you how the family's doing. Been very much in my prayer since your dad had the accident last week. So I I think things are trending the right direction. My dad, I was with him last night. He's, I mean, he looks for a 93 year old man who had hip replacement surgery and a broken fibula and all, and the pneumonia after the surgery. Dude's doing great. Um, he's still in a in a facility, but he's he's doing wonderful. Thank you so much. My mom has some some heart issues that popped up over the last few days. She's in the hospital right now. Um, and last night when I left her, she was feeling much better. We're, we'll, we'll hope to get her home soon, but I'll get more of an update later. But thank you for thinking about my family. Bro. Well, do you know what? So on the way back from my honeymoon, our layover was in Miami. And uh, you've been to the Miami airport how many times? Hundreds probably in your life? Yeah. Close. And very spacious, right? Very spacious, spread out airport. We walked from one terminal. They were next to each other, but we didn't take the tram. So we walked from, I believe it was Terminal C to B or something like that. And do you believe that it was about, probably about a 10 to 15 minute walk? I did not see one David Nuno statue, sign, reference. Nobody knew who you were. So I started to think maybe this guy has been, it's been a bit the whole time. Well, here's the thing about Miami. It's home of the, it's kind of like Dallas, the 40,000 a year millionaire. So uh -huh. there's a lot of David Nuno wannabes out there. <laughs> but if you walk by and saw Versailles or Versailles, as the, uh, the Americans that's where I, say. That's that, where I had my Cubano sandwich and I ordered in Spanish. Well, that place is, is you know, it's a tribute to me. That's why it's there. Okay. Well, thank you. It was delicious. It was very good. How, how Tasty was airport the food. It was awesome, man. I, we, yeah. we will go back to St. Thomas for sure. No question. What we're trying to decide now that me and my wife have gotten a, a little island, I guess, a taste of, of like the Caribbean stuff is like, do we want to go back to the U.S. Virgin Islands or do we want to start trying to pick off Barbados, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, you know, St. Vincent, all those? Uh, or do we want to keep going back to the place? Because St. Thomas was awesome. It was fantastic. I would encourage anybody that's looking into go to going on a trip there to, to do it. The people were at, like such good energy and they're infectious and just it was everything's pretty accessible. Uh, you got to get used to them driving on the left side of the road. Uh, that's a little bit you know appalling, I guess. When you get there, it's like this is crazy. But you know you're never driving; you're taking taxis everywhere, and those are people that are that live there. So there's no problem, you know, with transportation. But we had a great, great time. It was a wonderful week. Talking to Ryan Broninger, recruiting country. Bronny, uh, a good weekend of recruiting. I don't know where we start things off. I mean, maybe Dejan Petaway and Kelvion Riggins. Do you want to maybe take them in parts as those guys commit to Texas A&M and what they could mean? And I even read one of your comps online uh, on TexAgs.com for Dejan Petaway that kind of got me intrigued. Uh, let, let's start off there if we can. Yeah, so Dejan's a kid that obviously the A&M staff has known about for a long time and has been. he's a kid that's been very familiar with A&M for a long time because of – Damian Sanford, his older brother, being recruited, uh, you know, started getting recruited even when Mike Elko was here toward the tail end of that. Uh, but in earnest, got recruited by the previous staff. But Dejan has been coming on trips here, uh, coming to camps at Texas A&M since Mike Elko was on staff as a defensive coordinator, and he was a freshman in high school. And uh, the Aggies were one of his first offers. Uh, the Aggies had done a great job of, through the transition, continuing their communication and I think I don't think I know that Dejan was a kid that Mike Elko, Ish Aristi, Jordan Peterson put a very high priority on almost immediately when they started looking at the 2025 recruiting cycle now what I wrote and what I what I said in our in-home visit after his commitment and then what I wrote yesterday on my column on the site was that Look, just you had all these things going for you with Dejan, right? So it's not just Damian Sanford, his brother, being on the roster. You also signed a former teammate of his in DJ Hicks. You also had the proximity factor from Katie Pato High School to Texas A&M's campus is like right at an hour. Um, so it's very drivable. This kid's been coming up to your campus 
Uh, I, I would bet that Dejon Petaway has made 10 to 15 trips to Texas A&M over the last two or three years of his life. Uh, seen multiple football games, been to junior days, been to camps. Uh, he's, he's about seen and done it all. What that does, to me, is amplify the pressure to get him, to land him whenever Georgia, Oklahoma, LSU, all these schools that are big-time powers, Ohio State, are recruiting him heavily. You need to win that one. It doesn't mean that it's easier. It just means that you really need to do it with all the stuff you've got going for you. And so uh, it was vitally important that Mike Elko and company get that one over the line uh, for all those reasons, but more, more so than all the connections that he's got to Texas A&M is that you need to start landing elite football players, and that's what Dejan Petaway is. Uh, my comparison to him, he is a more advanced version of Tyreek Chappelle coming out of high school, in my opinion. When I watched Tyreek Chappelle's tape, now I didn't get to up there to, to Philly to see him when he was coming out of high school, but when you watch their tape, you see how they're built. There's a lot of similarities in their overall athletic profile, uh, their frame, their wingspan, but I think Dejon is a, a little bit of, of a level above of where Chappelle was coming out. And Dejon, I talked to Coach Hicks down there, DJ Hicks's dad, who's the head coach at Katie Pato. Coach Hicks talked a lot about the steps that Dejon has taken in terms of his overall physicality and his willingness to come up and play against the run. Early in his high school career, he was more of a cover, cover guy, liked to run around the back end in the pass game. He is really – taking huge strides forward in his physicality and the run game and his willingness to tackle. And you see that when you pop in his junior film. He's also made huge strides in terms of his maturity. I know that Coach Hicks told me that out of necessity, they had to move him away from corner last year uh, to safety. And when they went and asked Dejon if he'd be willing to do that, he, he green-lighted it you know, tenfold and said, whatever, whatever will help the team, I will do. Um, so he had to play a little bit out of position last year, but also helped him learn more secondary positions and, and help uh, bring some more versatility to his game. And and so I think the Aggies with Petaway are getting one of the premier cover guys, one of the premier defensive backs in the state of Texas. And I think it's also a really good marker for you in greater Houston because Dejan's a highly respected kid, well-known kid, and there's some real similarities between him and Houston and then Kelvion Riggins in Dallas. Well, I, I definitely want to get more into what the vibe is. I, I know you had an awesome piece uh, that, that posted, I think, yesterday. Let's talk about Riggins, uh, the three-star out of Forney, and what he brings to the table and what, how he ended up at AM. and m Yeah, I, I would hesitate to put star ratings next to anybody's name that's just now completing their junior season. Obviously, there are some that are going to be more advanced than others, but if you – even as an amateur novice football fan, football eye, Watt can watch that Kelvion Riggins tape and say it's a three-star tape. And then when you get to see the kid in person and his physicality, uh, the guy doesn't miss – he's going to be one of Tommy Moffitt's favorites. He doesn't miss workouts, dude. Uh, and he takes that stuff real serious. He's extremely advanced uh, in, in the weight room and from a play strength standpoint as well. But when you watch the tape, man, it's it's really, really good. Like the way he triggers and once he once he sees what's happening in front of him, it's like firing a gun, man. Like he explodes through the line of scrimmage. Uh, he makes a ton of tackles at or behind the line of scrimmage. Jason has seen him more than anybody else. He he talks about his abilities and coverage uh, and and kind of how he feels the game as a linebacker in coverage and uh, he doesn't look out of place there at all. Like He's a pretty well-rounded player and prospect, but whenever I watch the tape, I'm just so impressed by the way he triggers down downhill uh, and, and is not afraid of contact. And it was, you know, he started his high school career at South Oak Cliff. He moves to, to Forney, and when he does that, he kind of changes the defensive style that he's playing in. So he goes from like a stand-up edge player to an off-the-ball linebacker. So that move to Forney – has really helped his development as a true stand-up behind the defensive line linebacker. Um, and you, so you're only going to see him get better with those things, those reads, uh, having a feel for flows and all that kind of stuff that just comes with playing linebacker, the stuff that Torian York excels so much at. 
you're going to see him t- continue to take strides forward in those areas the more that he plays at linebacker. But, and again, it's, that's why I think it's pretty similar to Petaway. More importantly than Petaway, though, because a and always had a great presence in the city of Houston, always. Regardless of what was going on with the coaches, whatever, a and always did a great job in Houston. Where they had fell off was in the Metroplex. So when Jason and I would sit down and talk before this cycle really begun, and Mike Elko coming in, he had to do a couple. Of, we felt like there were two tactical decisions they would have to make in the state uh, to kind of get the ball rolling in the right direction, and they've done that. Number one, and we've talked about it ad nauseum, we don't need to continue to break it down, but number one was that they had to go back in and mend fences within the Texas high school football coaching community. Um, and not just there, but in all areas of the state with coaches, trainers, the whole thing that had to be mended. I mean, it was getting to the point where it was going to be a debilitating black eye for them uh, or a debilitating hurdle for them to have to clear if they didn't go in and nip that in the bud ASAP. And Coach Elko did that without question. Second thing that that we felt like they had to do was establish themselves or reestablish themselves and have a a re-energized presence in Dallas-Fort Worth. So, one of the first commitments that they get in this class is not only an outstanding player and a really cool kid, and and Jason's done a ton of interviews with Kelvion and we'll continue to talk to him. He's such an outgoing and kind of infectious personality. But they went into Dallas-Fort Worth and they got one of the best players early in, in the region early on in the recruiting cycle. That is huge. They have got to get more of a presence in the Metroplex. There's like no questions asked. That had to be done. So this was a, a really good flag in the ground for them in the Metroplex because A, Kelvion's a really good player, and because B, he is – very outgoing and very well known amongst the top prospects in that area. So he can be kind of a pod piper in North Texas for your efforts going forward. And and look, Mike Elko and his staff, they're in Dallas again today. Like they are making it a priority to reestablish themselves up there. And so I thought it was really important for a lot of reasons for them to, to land Kelvion and do it this early. Ronnie, I want to kind of stay on that topic, but in a different perspective, you talked about the work that they had to do with these high school coaches I think that work not only is being recognized, but it's being felt in other areas where you see trainers, right? These trainers who are so close to these athletes. Oftentimes, I'd read stuff negative about AM from some of these trainers. And recently, and I, I think I saw one yesterday, and uh, you may have posted one recently, like there, there's kind of a switch like, hey, there's something brewing in College Station. I like the vibe. And that's kind of changed a little bit. Yeah, I talked to two of the trainers out of Greater Houston who were on campus with players last weekend at the junior day. And they said similar stuff that the players, the recruits were saying coming off of these visits. New vibe, fresh energy. There's just something different that's happening at A&M. And you know, I talked to Dejon Petaway after he committed to A&M and just kind of asked him about some of the differences that he saw. He echoed those same things. But, I mean, it's, every, it's everything. It's the organizational structure of what they're doing right now, David. Again, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm talking bad about the previous staff. It's very different. It's almost night and day different in terms of the organization, the agenda, how structured everything is when these kids come on campus to the point where, like, we have not heard one story. And they've had weekends where they're hosting a – remember that week where they had all those transfer portal guys in uh, on top of a couple of high school recruits? We have not heard one story about a kid being – feel like they're neglected or uh, there were big holes and gaps in their itinerary throughout the day. We've heard nothing like that. And that's a, a testament because it starts at the top with stuff like that, right? We knew Mike Elko was very organized and was going to be very structured in how he wanted to do things. But it has to trickle down to his day-to-day operations, recruiting operations staff. Uh, we've seen him diversify the staff in terms of responsibility and give everybody specifics. Uh, and, and it seems like up to this point, the various people within his recruiting machine have been very efficient with how they operate in their realm. And because there, there's a lot of specificity to what each person does, it allows them to be efficient in their operation, right? Because there's not a lot of clutter and crossover. This guy, David Nuno, is responsible for portal recruiting, and that's it. 
Christian Nuno is responsible for high school offensive recruiting, and that's it. Cruz Nuno is responsible for defensive high school recruiting, and that's it. So when you don't have a lot of crossover, you get to be very focused on your one area, you're going to be very efficient. And then it comes back to communication flows. Okay, I have this information. Who does it go to next, and how does it get disseminated from there across the coaching staff? So right now, just – and this isn't just an a and m football thing. This is a business organization thing. It's working out very well. It's very efficient, and it's very well-rounded. If that would be the biggest descriptor that I could give this coaching and recruiting staff right now is that their approach has been, just been so well-rounded. Like, there's not an area where you feel like they're missing something. Like, there's not, like, a weak link anywhere right now. That may manifest itself or come to, come to the forefront throughout the cycle but through the first couple of months they've it's been a pretty tight-knit operation Ronnie I, I got a lot more to ask about that um in the in the next segment because there, there's certain things about the way and I, I'll ask it here and then we'll hit a break and then we'll come back with some other stuff but like how much of it is that's just how coach Elko is wired and how much of it is they saw a glaring hole and all right, we're going to fix that and we're going to do it like this. Is it maybe a combination of the two? I'm sure it's a combination of both. His general disposition and personality and kind of how his brain is configured. But you also, I think that is so, it was so valuable that for four years he got to sit here every day and look at this place and go, man, this, this got everything, but I would do this different. I, I might change this. Well, this. I can see that this organization – is lacking, like there's a huge gap in the communication flow in this area. I would fix that. So how invaluable is that to him right now? I don't know. You'd have to ask him in the next chance that we get. But it seems like having a background at this place and seeing how, what it could be and understanding the recruiting grounds and the important people that you have to talk to in these things and you know, kind of how, how big the operation can be can also mean it can be really messy, right? Because you're dealing with so many people. So you have to be very streamlined in how the information flows, how the responsibilities are divvied up. And I think he understood that coming in. And so I think it's a combination. It's, it's how he's wired, but it's also the stuff that he learned from being here for four years uh, from 20, well, 2018 to 2022. All right, let's do this. Let's hit a break. Bronny, we're going to come back. If you have a question for Bronny, you can text it in at 979-693-1150. I also have to ask about Terry Bussey when we come back, the latest there. So we'll get into some more specifics here on Recruiting Country, brought to you by Caprock Health System. But right now we're talking Millican Reserve, a farm-to-table community. They're in College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got wide open spaces. And their mission is to build a healthy community around nature. And they've done that by treading lightly on the land that Millican Reserve can be found on, creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. They're dedicated to that conservation of a healthy community and they've got an awesome area, guys. 2,600 acres of open space. You've got farms. You've got trails. They want to connect families to each other. So if your family's always, you know, watching stuff on their iPad or on TV, go out to Millicom Reserve. Go connect with each other. You can go hiking out there. You can go biking. You can go canoeing. You can do the equestrian trails. You can go walking. You can do the evening yoga. you got the summer camps, the music festivals, the farmer market tours, and the farm tours. All that at one beautiful place. If you want to live there, amazing real estate. If you just want to hang there, they highly encourage that as well. You can learn more at millicumreserve.com. Again, that website, millicumreserve.com. It's Millicum Reserve.
anything, anything academy related on the mob. All right, we're back for more Recruiting Country presented by Cap Rock Health System. It is Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. I'm in my own Rollo Insurance Studio. Bronny is in the Rollo Insurance Studio there in College Station, Texas. Bronny, uh, he's been a big name for a long time. Let's talk about Terry Bussey. I know, was it last night or the night before? Um, well, Ish and Holman went out to, to be with him in Timpson. Just uh, give us the latest on how things are with Terry Bussey. Yeah, so as of this morning, Terry has arrived at LSU for a final visit in Baton Rouge before signing day. Uh, we fully anticipate him here this weekend for his second official visit to Texas A&M. That's long been scheduled. We have maintained for really since about early January. I don't know. It, the, in-home, the last in-home visit that Mike Elko did where they brought, I believe, seven members of the staff in home with Terry – from the conclusion of that visit to now, we have felt very confident in A&M's standing uh, and A&M's ability to ultimately sign him and hold on to him. And we have heard nothing up to this point, even off the back of a, an official visit to Georgia last weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. We haven't heard nothing that would indicate otherwise uh, for Terry. And – they're going to have to survive this visit to LSU. The Tigers have kind of been A&M's biggest nemesis in this thing for a long time. But we think A&M can, can do this. We think A&M can hold on. And uh, if they do, I mean, you have to talk about what that would signify for a lot of things, most notably like a huge uh, – I mentioned some flags in the ground with the class of 25. I mean – putting a stamp on this 24 class and doing so signing Terry Bussey. Now he was committed to Texas A&M, but he wasn't committed to this coaching staff. If they're able to hold on to him uh, and get him on campus and what he could do to next year's roster and future rosters, that would that would probably be the biggest recruiting job by Mike Yoko um, since he arrived in college station as the head man. Ronnie, what do you make of, of both Ish going out there and, and having the conversation in person with Holman and Ish uh, to get this done? Yeah, I just think it further signifies and highlights their willingness to play him on either side of the ball, right? When you have the, the corners coach and the receivers coach go out there and you watch Terry in these all-star games, the Under Armour All-American Bowl and then the Polynesian Bowl in Hawaii and the impact that he's had offensively, it's hard to just – assume he's just the only thing that he can do to help you win football games is at corner. I think it's pretty clear that, and especially nowadays where we're seeing a little bit of a run on two way players. I don't think you need to pigeonhole him on one side of the ball. I think you need to come in and allow him to kind of figure it out on his own. Maybe he's way more of an impactful player on the offensive side. Maybe he's a day one starter at corner or nickel. You don't know that, but you have to give him the opportunity to kind of his athletic ability to kind of work itself out. Uh, I think he can impact games as, as a punt and kick returner. So just sensational athlete that I think a lot of people may have had questions about his five-star status coming from a, a, such a small town in Timpson. But whenever he goes to Orlando and does that against the best players in the country, he goes out to Hawaii and, and performs the way he did against some of the top high school talent uh, out there, you go, okay, like this – clearly this five-star thing is sticking, and it's not just he's so much better than everybody he's playing against in these small towns across East Texas. No, he's like – he is one of the top players in the state of Texas, regardless of whether he went to Timpson, Texarkana, or, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth. It doesn't matter. Like, he is legitimately a five-star player and uh, a game-winning type of player at the next level. Ronnie, uh, we're a week away from National Signing Day. We'll have a special show. It'll be uh, just a little different vibe next week when we do it. Uh, any potential like moments of like, ha-ha, look what we just did? Or do you think it, it is pretty much what it is, Terry Bussey and company? Um, stay tuned. Hmm. Stay tuned. We're tracking some stuff. 
it'll be interesting to see what comes out, where it comes from, uh, who. But we're 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 tracking some stuff behind the scenes. I'll leave it at that. I like it. That's a great tease, and it can mean many things. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Eric Casares has got a question, I believe, from Matt in San Antonio. Eric. Yeah, Matt in San Antonio said, ask Brian recruiting segment, looking at this 2025 class, how strong is your confidence meter that we will land a top 10 class? Is it a slam dunk or more a very strong possibility in your view? Uh, and you don't ever slam dunk anything in recruiting. I mean, doing that is pretty foolish, knowing what we know about uh, the fluidity of the, the entire thing nowadays, especially with the portal. And, you know, I, I heard what Billy said on Monday about there used to be it used to be kind of a necessity that you recruit at a top six seven level year and you're out. I don't think that that I don't, I don't think that that has gone anywhere. Like I, I think that ideally you want to bring in high school classes that are in that range, but now that you can supplement so much with the portal, uh, it, it's not just an absolute must anymore. Like you have a little bit of a fallback, a little bit of a safety net with the portal, but. With as much talent as in the state of Texas in this 2025 class, Houston and in Dallas, I, I have a hard time believing that they won't sign a top 10 high school class. Like, I think that I, I feel pretty good about saying that right now in January, late January. Brian, before I let you go, did you get to listen to – you probably didn't because you were busy on your honeymoon, but did you get a chance to uh, maybe go back and listen to Schloss and how pumped are you? It's like literally right down the street. It's right, right around the corner. Yeah, actually, I've, I've, and I've got some notes potentially coming out later <clears throat> this week about just some of the stuff that's going on in practice and lead into the season. But uh, I, I'm super excited. I think this team can be really good, man. I, the, the biggest question mark is obviously on the pitcher, pitcher's mound and how does Ryan Prager bounce back? What does the sophomore campaigns look like for Justin Lampkin and Shane Sadeo? You know, can Evan Oshenbeck continue to have that same kind of impact that he did last year? Do you even need him to? You know, what is the next – if Chris Cortez gets right under Max Wiener, what does that do for this ball club? Well, they expect huge impacts from Tanner Jones and Peyton Smith and Zane Badmayev. Like, there's so much intrigue on the pitching side. We've got a pretty good idea of what the offense is going to look like, and it could be pretty special. I mean, when you just start toying around with, with who could hit where, uh, who could play where, there's so much positional versatility – there's so much talent. David, they're going to have guys sitting on the bench this year that could be in a minor league farm system somewhere trying to you know, propel themselves to the big leagues. And they're going to sit on the bench this year for probably big chunks of the season. It's just when you hire Jim Schlossnagel in three years ago now and you hire Nolan Kane, you knew that talent acquisition was not going to be a problem going forward. Now they're in a spot, man, like this team. I'm just telling you, raw talent-wise is the best one he's had since he's been – and it's not close. Like you're sitting there toying around with lineups, David, and you're going, what happens if you hit Jay Slavolette, Braden Montgomery, and Gavin Grohovic, some combination of those, and right behind each other in a lineup? You realize that's three – not just professional players. Like, that's three big leaguers. When's the last time an A&M offense, as good as some of those were in the Rob Childress era, as functional as they were in 2022, how many times have you, as Texas A&M, trotted out a lineup where you had that? Not just – I mean, those are all first-round draft picks as position players. We've seen it done on the mound here. I don't think we've seen it done offensively. And, and that's – that's excluding guys like Hayden Schott, who's off to a great start this spring. That's excluding guys uh, like Ryan Targotch and all the home runs and RBIs he's had in an A&M uniform, or guys like Teddy Burton who have had so much success at a Power 5 level. Like, that's without even talking about them. So uh, the offense has a chance to be really, really good and really, really tough for opposing pitchers. The biggest intrigue for me is what what is – what kind of impact does Max Wiener have on this on this pitching staff? Ronnie, great stuff, brother. Thank you yep, so much, thank man. Thank you. All right, we're going to hit a break. When we come back, a little pound in the rock hop. We'll be in the studio, talk a little basketball. We'll try to finish off with some text messages there at 979-693-1150. It's Tech Sacks Radio. We'll be back in two and two.
All right, time to pound the rock here on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, 911 University Drive East in College Station, where you can get Rolexes. You can also hook up your David Yerman collector. Check out the website, davidgardnersjewelers.com. We go to the studio, the Roller Insurance Studio, and that's where we find Hop, David Sandhop with us. What's up, Hop? How you doing, sir? Well, uh, if we get a few more W's, it'll be a lot better. Well, let's let's start things off because I, I saw somebody start a thread about you. I think it was started where they were propping you up for having level headedness when it comes to this team. You seem to me, from what I've read, to obviously not like the trajectory of where this thing could be going, but also see a path to where things can kind of fix themselves out. Well, that's right. I mean, to me, if you look at history, that Buzz Williams teams always in the second half of conference play seem to get that momentum going and so you say well if it's they if he's done it in the last two years you would think he could do it this year although as we keep going that path keeps getting uh, narrower and narrower and it doesn't help that path when teams like ohio state lose six of the last seven smu starts losing so all of those great wins in november aren't as great anymore. And then when you're not winning in the SEC, it just makes that path much narrower. And it, it's, there's no question, uh, there's there's a chance for them to, there's a realistic chance for them to get to get where they need to get to the tournament. But it's also, it's, it's a concern at this point. So looking at the team stats um, we have here, Caitlin put it together for us. Field goal percentage, 39%. Three-point percentage, 26.7%. But the one that jumps out at me is the free throw percentage at 69.2. Uh, we've talked a lot about free throws this week, uh, Hop, but this is that's an area where a team that struggles offensively, who used to be good at the line, has to be good at the line. Yeah, and you know, and I don't have the stats from every game with me, but I thought they were doing okay in the free throw line in non-conference. Not not killing it, but they were you know in the low 70s. And uh, but I think for this team, it's the inconsistency. They'll have, I mean, two games ago, they made 25 free throws and then shot 74 percent. But then they come out this last game in what 12 of 22 in a in a three point game. And to me, the, the what really hurts is when Tyrese Radford in Wade missed free throws. And uh, yeah, Wade you know, still made most of his free throws, but we're used to Wade making 90% of his free throws. And when he makes 70%, you look and go, there's one or two we could have had. You know, uh, Radford you know, was shooting in the high 70s last year. He's shooting in the high 60s this year. Uh, that's another one or two free throws a game. And that's how you lose three-point ball games. Yeah, and here's the thing, we know that this team is going to be tight with every game that they play. Like, that's just the kind of basketball that they play. They may be down by a bunch, but they're going to have a chance at the end. They may be up by 10 or 7 points in the last couple of minutes, but it's going to come down to a possession, and that's where those points come and bite you, Hop. Yeah, and, you know, you look at these games, uh, and, and we've talked about the formula. Hey, if you, you win the offensive rebounding, you win the turnovers, you're going to get more shots, and even if we're shooting, uh, you know, 39%, we're going to end up winning. But the concern this last game, uh, from their standards, they shot pretty average. I mean, it was not – I mean, Wade hit three or four threes there in the first part of the game. The shooting percentage wasn't that bad. They actually won the offensive rebounding. Uh, but if you look, they didn't win it by enough. And so you get to a point to where when you talk about, well, a and is great in offensive rebounding, they have to dominate to really make a difference. I mean, they uh, – you know, with um, – Ole Miss, they they won the offensive rebounding by you know five or six. But the key, if you look, uh, Ole Miss, the game winner for them ultimately was the offensive putback. It uh, they scored to go up sixty two sixty. You just can't with the way this team is built and the way this team, the path to success, they've got to dominate those categories. Yeah, no no doubt. Let's talk Wade for a moment because he has been heroic. He's been huge, and sometimes he being so big. I don't want to say it hurts them because without them, they're not they're not in these games. But we went through some stats earlier in the show when he and Boots are the ones leading the way, and it's just them. They're not winning games. They've got to spread it out. Uh, but Wade saves them, so that's why he does what he does. Hop. Huh? Well, if you look at 
at the end of game stats. You say, hey, Wade had 28 points. Wade had 30 points. Looks great, and it is. But if you look inside the numbers, the efficiency numbers are down. I mean, it'll, it'll, for him to score 30, he's going to shoot uh, you know, 25 times, make eight of them, and then go to the free throw line 10 times. Uh, but that's the only path they have at this point offensively. And I think that's ultimately that is the issue of why, you know, if you rely so much on two players, you know, the SEC teams, the coaches are watching the film. They know that we're going to do whatever we can to make it as difficult for Wade and Boots to score. And, hey, if Hayden Hefner beats us on the wing, so be it. If Jace Carter beats us on the wing, so be it. But I guarantee you it's not going to be Wade and Boots. And the problem for A&M is that the Hefners and the Carters and the, and the Obasikis aren't doing it when the other defenses are giving them the opportunity to beat them. Talking to a Hop here on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. A guy that I, I'm liking the way his game is going, but some people are not happy with is Jace Carter. Uh, not only the 12 rebounds, but I feel like he has been con- he's been consistent recently. His defense has been on point. Occasionally he can score for you. What have you seen from Jace? I, I, I thought he had a fabulous game against Ole Miss. I mean, not just the volume of rebounds, but in the, the, the times that he had the rebounds. I mean, going up against bigger guys, being strong. No, I, I love Jace Carter's game, and I know that uh, uh, I've mixed up with some folks on the message board who who see his uh, shooting percentage and say, well, he's not. I said, no, but he's doing what he needs to do. He's doing what Buzz wants him to do. Uh, now, he hit 1-3 uh, last game, and I think he has a, a pretty sound stroke. So to me, I think the issue with Jace and with a lot of the players shooting, it's the quality of shot. I think sometimes, you know, Jace and those guys pull up for longer threes. They're shooting over defenders, an extended arm, as opposed to moving the ball and getting uh, half court movement to where you find the open man on the backside pass. We haven't had a lot of that uh, this season. And I think to me, I look, that's just as much of an issue than the actual making the shot because if it's an easier shot, you have a better chance of making it. If it's a if it's a contested shot from from thirty feet, it's it's going to be a lot uh, more difficult to, to make those shots. Yeah, uh, and I, I got to say, you know, we're we're over here talking about particular players, and Anderson Garcia has been getting a lot of props recently. But this this dude deserves it, right? Like, there was a time Hop where I cringe when he touched the ball offensively. One thing I, I've noticed is his passing is phenomenal. His vision is really good, and He's a pretty efficient scorer when he gets out. Like, I don't want him taking a bunch of threes, but occasionally he'll hit them, and he definitely has the putbacks. Yeah, well, what I really like the, the play in the Ole Miss where, you know, he was uh, in, in kind of posted up looking to, to pass, couldn't find anybody, looked around and turned, and, and I guess the, the defenders thought he was going to pass too, and he went and took it and he stuffed it. Uh, those things, you're right, uh, Anderson Garcia is the definition of a Buzz Williams ball player. Comes in without much hype. He was a transfer that was kind of a, 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 a secondhand. No one really – what didn't make big news. And, you know, he had a, a solid first year. But as he, as he grew more and more with Buzz Williams and with his team, he's really become not only a great rebounder, as you said, but the guy that's, that's going to tip the ball in a critical situation to a teammate. He's going to make the good pass. And like I said, and he'll make the occasional uh, big play offensively. Hey, Hop, when you watch this team play, what do you think is their best offense? Like, what do you see when they're like, all right, the offense is clicking? Wow, that's a, that's a tough question because I, I see, you know, I, I see very little ball movement. I see that uh, they'll make one or two passes to the wing back and forth, and you look up and it's uh, Boots or Wade, you know, at the top with 10 seconds to go, and they kind of improvise. I don't know. I know that um, when uh, Henry was at his best before the injury, they got a lot out of uh, him coming into the high post and getting an entry pass, and then he would either uh, find somebody outside or he would actually drive from the elbow. He would drive the lane and get to the line or make shots. Um, I think that presence at the elbow needs to needs to 
get back into this into in these offensive sets because once you get the ball inside and the defense knows that hey this is a weapon and they and they put uh, some attention to them there will be somebody else open uh, on the perimeter but in the last month there just hasn't been there haven't been those opportunities because the presence at the elbow hasn't been there Hop, I agree with you. And what I'm about to tell you is not an offensive set. It's an offensive mentality. What I want to see more of is running. I want to see them run, 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 force the action. I think too often they um, they settle on just this half-court set, and they don't have the plays to develop them out of that half-court set, especially late in the shot clock. So I want to see them push the uh, the tempo, not necessarily take bad threes on that, but attacking the rim when possible. Yeah, and I think um, uh, two games ago, I think Buzz mentioned they, sw- they they changed some things on defense on on their switches that has allowed them to be a little more disruptive. And I think their turn the their toner, turnover rate of their opponent has gone up the last uh, two games and live ball turnovers. That's the key. Uh, it's one thing when a, the, your opponent throws the ball out of bounds. It's another thing when your opponent throws it to your guy who's running in transition and for a fast break. And so that's one area where they have improved that you can put some hope into that uh, they do need to create more fast break points. The, the first half of the season, I thought that they were one of the, the lower uh, ranked teams in fast break points. That is ticked up. So that's one thing to look for is that that's one area where I think they can improve going forward. So this Florida game, how concerned, worried, slash, you should be better than Florida. Florida's winning a lot right now. Like, uh, where are you when it comes to this particular matchup, Hop? You know, I, I was saying before the Ole Miss game, I was saying uh, the Florida game concerned me more than the Ole Miss game. The matchup isn't on paper. Is The, the Ole Miss was not a very good rebounding team on paper. We found out later that uh, they did a lot better uh, on the boards. Florida is an excellent rebounding team. This is not a great great matchup for Texas A&M. I think A&M, number one in offensive rebounding, Florida's number two in the nation. And so it's it's – a and going to have to come up with a formula. I don't know what that formula is uh, coming in because I don't think they're going to be able to win on out-rebounding Florida by 10 rebounds in six or seven offensive rebounds. That's not going to happen. So how so how do you attack them? I don't, I don't know. So we'll, we'll see what happens on Saturday. But this is a critical game, uh, David. In fact, you, if you look right now, A&M is ninth, tied for ninth in the SEC. Most folks uh, are projecting SEC getting eight teams in. So you can do the math, and teams like Florida are right there with A&M. Ole Miss was right with A&M. It would be devastating to lose both of those games, teams that you're fighting with, that you're going to be fighting with on the bubble. So you know, you look at this, You know, South Carolina winning last night. Uh, all of a sudden, you're thinking you know, South Carolina's with A&M. No, South Carolina's now moved up. They're taking a spot. Uh, so all of a sudden, there's one fewer spots in the SEC for the NCAA tournament. Now a and battling with, uh, you know, four or five teams for those last three spots. And that's where things are starting to get a concern and a bit dicey. And they definitely need to win some games. And they also need to win. They need to win one of three games against the two against Tennessee and one against Alabama because they need to get their net back up because it's been, it's been dropping with the losses and with the teams they beat are also losing. And you mentioned all that. Ole Miss had this high perception. Then they kind of dropped. They seem to be back on track. And South Carolina kind of coming out of nowhere, man. Yeah. I mean, two top ten wins in a week. And, uh, you know, they're second place in the SEC. So you look at that and say, well, uh, you know, you keep saying, well, when is South Carolina come, coming back down to earth? I think after last night we can say they're not going to come down to earth. But that with that said, that does provide an opportunity because you get South Carolina later in the year, which all of a sudden now is uh, looks like that could be a, a, a Q1 uh, opportunity. So it's it's it gets to the point now in the season where you're you're counting wins, you're looking at what the other teams are doing. But for A&M, they they you just have to win games at this point. You, there's no other. You're at three and four. You know you figure. To be safe, you need to get uh, eleven and seven. Probably ten and eight will do it. But uh, that means you have to find you have to find seven wins somewhere along the way. Let's pounding the rock with Hop. Hop, thanks, buddy. Take, you take got care. It. Mm-hmm.
All right, we're going to hit a break here. We'll come back with one final short segment here on Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, final segment here of Tech Sags Radio. Time to end the day with Double Day. It's caller number 12, 979 693 1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or one large, one topping pizza from Double Day, serving Aggie Land since way back when in 1984. They got your favorite pizza and world famous pepperoni rolls with reliable in house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on doubledaves.com and your favorites are on the way. Got about a minute and a half, two minutes left in the program. We go back to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. And Mr. Casares, I know a lot of love for uh, Tommy Moffat. Yeah, a lot of love to Tommy Moffat. The one that I, I have right now is uh, Tony and Skidmore said uh, he wanted to just give a little bit of a shout out to Hops. He said he always gives the outlook of the basketball team in a positive way instead of negativity and wanted to thank him for coming into the show today. So uh, big, ho- uh, big props there to Hops. Uh, going back to, uh, who'd you say, David? Uh, all the, the responses to Tommy Moffat. Tommy Moffat. Uh, I'll handle it for you, buddy. I got you. Oh, the, Jim, is it the, the Jim and Tipple. I got, I got you. I got you. Jim and Tipple. Uh, listening to Tommy Moffat, when I included from the things he said, no a and player of the position group will be soft ever again, physically, mentally, etc. No one will be tardy anymore, like under Jimmo. Otherwise, suffer the consequences. Look. I really believe in like a mindset that we're here to work guys. Um, and I understand young men will be young men. And sometimes, you know, even as an, a, an older guy with why or with a little bit of wisdom, we, we want to have a good time, 
but there should be an expectation, especially when your program has not reached the levels that it's supposed to reach, right? There should be an expectation of how, what kind of work and what it's going to look like. And if you are late, there are consequences because if you don't give consequences and you learn this with your own children, then people will continue to make repeated mistakes. I love his philosophy. I love that he's old school. I love that he's adapted to the times with a little bit of science base and also no nonsense. And I think he's gonna be a perfect fit for a &M. And then you're right. Um, was it Chris Gordy was like, LSU is going to, you know, wonder why didn't we go after Tommy Moffat? Why did we let him go in the first place? So, all right, that's going to do it here for Tech Sags Radio on a Wednesday. Really appreciate Coach Moffat coming into the show. Obviously, Bronny was fantastic. Hop as well. Steve Denton, Tom Schubert, Coach Pat Henry, Chris Gordy, and Olin Buchanan. That's going to do it for Tech Sags on a Wednesday. We'll see you manana.